One of the things I want to do this morning is answer a question that I received many, many times from students is, what am I going to do with my graduate degree? You know, I'm here, I'm spending a lot of money, and I'm trying to position myself at a, on a higher platform. I want to beat my competition. I want to have a chance to excel in the world. But I don't know what that means to a lot of people because they don't really know the real estate industry that well. The real estate industry is, com is unbelievably complex, made up of many, many different pieces. And in doing uh, a large, diverse uh, number of different uh, work, the bodies of work, and I'm, we're going to go over a lot of that, okay? Uh, now, in the course of our discussions here, if you if you've got something you want to ask me a question or anything, don't be shy, uh, because a lot of times go off on a tangent in a good way, and uh, and we go and we talk about you know, some serious things. Um, so. Um, let me, uh, Tom, uh, did you put the... Yep. Focused on that in, in your organization or in your community, 
or in those of you that are going to be entrepreneurs, and I can tell you there's a, a number of people in here, whether they know it or not, are going to be entrepreneurs and want to run their own businesses and do their own businesses. And just to digress for a moment, some human beings, like we all are, don't want to go out there and be the leader and take all the risks. They'd rather share that with other people so they're more happy and they're more successful in a group of people. So they like to be in an organization. Then there's people who like to be in an organization but want to run the organization. So, so we, we're, all make, we're all made up of all these different characteristics. But it all comes into play here one thing. Then you have to do land planning. How are you going to use the land? How, how are you going to uh, uh, maximize the return on that land? And am I, am I planning the land for what the, pe the buyers really need? A, a simple explanation of what our, our real role is, is to identify needs. This is important. Identify needs and then fill those needs with your business. If you don't, and you just build things for the sake of building things, it was like that movie years back, if I build it, will they come? And I can assure you, because I've done it myself, and Charlie probably been around a bunch of projects that um, uh, uh, in, in not an any plan way, we built things that nobody wanted. We thought we were so smart, and so, oh, how can they fail? How can this fail? I got the best architect, I got the best this, I got the you know, but you didn't fill the needs of the people in the marketplace. So that's where a lot of things pivots on success. Because uh, at any moment in time, whether it is a recession, a depression, a boom, there are specific needs that have to be filled. Um, and then you have to get entitlements. You've got to get zoning. You've got to get people, all these governments to agree with you. Now, you may found out that this particular section of you're in Miramar, let's say, and it said, and, you, and, and the research, and the due diligence said, you've got to build, you have to build towns, townhouses here. That's really what you need here in the market. And you go into the city planning department, they go, oh, we don't want townhouses in Miramar. We want mansions. I said, yeah, but nobody here in Miramar is going to buy mansions. They need townhouses. So there's this fight all the time uh, with, with, with government entities. They need. If the project is big enough, you've got to do a traffic study. You've got to do a study on infrastructure, roads, utilities, and so forth, because as a land developer, you're responsible for all that. Uh, usually, you involve a lot of civil engineering work. You, gotta, you have to estimate how much money it's going to take to put all the pipe in the ground, to, to move the dirt to a certain elevation, and so forth. So it, it's, uh, that's where civil engineering is. Hydrology is something uh, special to Florida. It's the control of surface water. Uh, most of those lakes that you see in your everyday life in South Florida were, are man-made. Uh, what we do here in South Florida, we dig a big hole and we take the, the dirt that we get and we put it over here and we stockpile it and then we take all of the wetlands off and we come back and we spread all of the dirt over again. That's why when you see a project just getting started, there's nothing there. There's not even a twig, you know, because that's all the preparation needed to support the weight of the houses. The good thing about South Florida is, or most of Florida is, you put a twig in the ground and you have a tree in three years. So, uh, okay. Then you got the actual construction work, which is a picture of. I mean, there's all these different equipments and so forth to do it. And then you have the choice of maybe selling the land or, or, or banking the land, hold it on a balance sheet and, and hold it for future uh, growth and appreciation and so forth. So, in this whole st complex area of land development, you as developers, you as the experts, you as the leaders of our industry, you can concentrate this aspect of real estate and spend your whole life there. And and be, a, and be a land developer, which is very important to start any project. Every single piece of land has to be properly developed and planned and developed. So uh, there's somebody has got to do every one of those lines. Oh, yeah, sure. So I had a question under 
um, entitlements, is that when you get like the uh, developer's agreement in place? Yeah. With the, with the elected officials, the commission? Yeah, well, all the, in some localities, you have to sign a development contract or a contract uh, to verify the entitlements, <coughs> okay? And that gives you, uh, uh, you know, and that entitlement stays with the land as long as you're doing to the land what you promise you're going to do. Uh, they don't interfere with you. You just go ahead and, and build what you, you, you ask them to approve, okay? So they, that might contain the actual product the home builder's going to build or the, the, the actual retail store that somebody's going to build because it doesn't always have to be land for home building. I mean, we're talking about land for shopping centers, right, right. we're talking about land for apartment complexes and so forth. So, so then a land developer's business model is to acquire the dirt, get everything set up for it to be developed and then get out of it? Yeah, the key, well, if that's, if that's the objectives of the, your business model, if that's your mission to do it, prep it, do it, get it done, and then flip it, and then start all over again, that's a whole business unto itself. Other people with long-term investment goals do it and stockpile it and say, you know what, these lots are good today, but they're going to be worth a lot more money in the future. So I'm just going to sit on these. Now, you've seen driving around, you've seen land that's been like semi-approved, and you see all these pipes sticking out of the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, they're green or they're, they're yellow and so forth. That is land that is uh, prepped for future development, but it just, they leave it at that, that point. And uh, because those are longer term projects. So, any questions? So you all want to be land developers now, right? <laughs> Sorry, home building. Well, this will go a little fast enough. You can be a home builder. That's exactly what it says. That's what exactly what it is. And what do you have to do in being a home builder? Well, one of the most important things you've got to do is, is do some smart market research. I mean, am I building the right product for the right people? What are the needs? Am I filling the needs financially? The land use? Am I, am I filling the, the proper use of the land? And so forth. Then there's the whole... Uh, process of land acquisition, how do you buy land? If you're a home builder, you want to buy land that's almost totally developed. But you don't want to be in the land development business. You, most home builders just want to build houses. I mean, they just love building houses. And, and <coughs> land development is too complicated. They'd rather get an architect to do a set of plans and keep building houses and houses. That's, uh, so they're usually the last group to innovate. Uh, home builders are a real drag on the overall economy in that respect. Even today, with all the increase in technology and everything, if you look at the housing industry, it is really dumb. Uh, they're, they're not in the 21st century. I mean, they still want to build the houses the way they built them 20, 30 years ago. So they, they're forced to innovate. Is that, a, is that a function of like not wanting to pay for new designs or wanting to stick the with The simplest way to describe it, they just want to build houses. Okay. Right. <laughs> they got these plans, they built these houses already. Why can't I just do that again? Why do I have to learn all over again? New, new uh, architectural plans, new utility plans, new everything. It's so much simpler to just keep driving up and I'm being facetious. But a lot of him, uh, home builders are really great people, great business people. You can see one later, Harry Posen, he's a great home builder. Uh, but he'll be the first to tell you that there's no innovation going on right now in the home building industry. He and I talk about it all the time. He sends me emails in frustration. <laughs> Where's the innovation? Where's the AI? Where is it all happening? Very hard to find in our industry. <coughs> one of the exceptions. Uh, in our area that you would be familiar with is Lennar. Uh, they, are, they are way out in front of the rest of the industry, and they are the biggest home builders now. Uh, and they have incredible innovation, uh, laboratory uh, development of, of future housing, housing products, housing components, uh, integrating 3D printers, and, and a whole bunch of things. But 
but not many of the other builders are doing that. Uh, they just they just hope that things will go back to where they were. But let me share something with you. Hope is not a strategy. Right? Yes. Okay. Hope is not a strategy. And so you've got to take risks. You've got to stretch the envelope. You've got to get there where the next bond buyers are. Um, you are all uh, millennials. I would assume. Looking around. No? You were Gen X? Uh, yeah. Okay. But the, the, the second half of Gen X is a really millennials. I mean, they, they think more like them than not. Uh, now. I'm an early Gen X, so I mean, I'm still not. Okay. Um, now, just when we're getting comfortable trying to figure out what you guys want in life and everything, there's Gen, uh, Generation Z. Well, what the hell is Generation Z? Well, believe it or not, it's, it's the next generation after millennials. And they are actually getting into a position, the first wave of them, to become stand-up consumers in the marketplace and actually, in some cases, uh, uh, buyers of, of housing or apartments or something. I mean, some of them are, are approaching 20 years old, 21 years old, and this wave of gen, uh, Generation Z, they're going to they're gonna have different, a whole thing. they're going to think you're old-fashioned. I mean, because they're going to walk around with AI and 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 uh, into the internet. Uh, what is it? Five, whatever you call it. Uh, yeah. I mean, all these different technology things that are coming down the road, and that's who they are. And now you're part of that, but I'm telling you, they're going to be more advanced with this stuff than you are. So you're going to have the same problem that builders today have. How do I keep up with all of this? I, mean, I remember a number of years ago, Toll Brothers, which is a big upper end housing company in the country. I was on a panel with Bob Toll, the guy that uh, built Toll Brothers. And he said to me, this was a number of years ago, but he says, Tony, people walking into my sales office are smarter than my salesmen. They know more about my houses than we do. And this is maybe 10, 15 years ago. I mean, today, 85% of all housing sales start with the internet today. It'll probably be 95% in a couple of more years. But the old way of buying housing and everything, sales centers, advertising in the newspaper and everything, it's all passe. I mean, who, anybody here subscribe to newspapers every day? Look, okay, that's okay, you can go like this. <laughs> But that's what you, I mean, you, you all get your information, I guess, your news on the internet somewhere, or on your cell phone, or you get it on your computer, or whatever. I, I still get the Wall Street Journal every day because it's part old fashioned, but also, I think, the most informative information on a daily basis, and not only in, in finance, but also in important discussions on society. So, because we don't live in a vacuum. Okay. So they, the home builder goes through due diligence, financing structures, market operations, all these different things. So if you're a home builder, you have a pretty complex life. There's like 50,000 different pieces make up the average American home. Nails, screws, bolts. When you add them all up, it's tens of thousands of pieces. And I'm gonna show you how if we have time, how they're going to build a house with a 3D printer. They're doing it right now. I mean, they've actually got 3D printers that are, and two story, are actually pouring two-stories houses in 48 hours. Um, so these are the kind of changes. <coughs> then, you, then you have what we call the commercial section of real estate. This would be office, retail, industrial. Uh, and these are different uses of land. You can see there's an office building, there's a retail complex, and there's an industrial building. These three are, are you know, the, the, that's everything outside of residential. And they go through almost the same things, except they have different things they're concerned about. You know, how to use 
whatever they're building. If you're building a, a framework of a, a retail store, okay, what are the retail needs in that marketplace? You know, what kind of foods, a restaurant do we need here? What kind of clothing retail do we need it? Do we need it? Or is everything going to be on the internet? Well, we're still trying to figure that out. Uh, I was, yesterday I was with my wife, and we were on Glades, and she wanted to go look at something in the Macy, the big Macy outlet, retail outlet there. Uh, this is all furniture and a whole bunch of stuff. At 2 o'clock in the afternoon, yesterday, on Friday, there was one car in the parking lot. And I said, come on. This is where e-commerce is taking us. You know, I mean, Macy owns that lot, owns that big building and everything. They're struggling with, well, where do I go from here? How much do I, do I shut down? How much actual retail live product do I have to, am I going to need in the future? And, you know, some people say, I need to touch something. I need to feel something. Well, they're probably halfway guys. They go and they look and they feel, then they go back home and order it on the internet. So it's, we're, we're learning, you know. Uh, so how does that affect you? Well, if you're the developer of the land and these buildings, you have to be ahead of those people because you can develop land that nobody wants. And you say, gee, but this is, look at this great land plan we've got. We don't need it. Now, I'll digress from it. Autonomous cars. Gonna come down the road, I mean, I don't even wanna predict three years, five years, what, you know, some people say we'll be totally autonomous by 2025, and we're gonna be autonomous. I mean, there's no stopping. So what degree and so forth. So I have friends that own major shopping centers, and they're looking at their shopping centers and they're going, do we gonna need all this parking in the future? If autonomous cars are gonna be taking people there, picking them up, and they don't need to stay here, and they don't need to park anywhere, what am I gonna do with the 20 acres of parking that I have? Well, that's gonna be all of a sudden a whole new opportunity to change the zoning on that land to do something else with it. So to me, I think it's very positive. I think it's gonna free up a great deal of land in the middle of real developed urban areas so that you guys could have what you want. You want live, work, and play. You, you, want, you want to live with space, but at the same time, you want all the urban connections. So pure suburbs don't appeal to you, or most of you. You're not ready to drive 20 miles to go home every night. But you'd like a home, you'd like an apartment, but you want to walk three blocks to a restaurant, and you want to do all that, and you want to do most of your uh, living on computers. You want Amazon to, to deliver your food every night. You want, these, this is where you're all going, okay? So the exciting thing about the real estate industry is if you want to be smart, you want to make money, get out in front of that. And how do you get out in front of that? I give you one word, think. <laughs> think. Don't wait for somebody else to drop all the solutions into your lap. It's not going to happen. It's the innovator, it's the, it's the risk taker. I mean, you'll fail, we all fail at times. I mean, there was some project that I did that was so bad at the end, I, I get chilled just thinking about how dumb I was. And then there's other projects that I outsmarted myself. I mean, uh, so that's the nature of our business. High risk, high rewards, high risk, big, big losses. Uh, there's not a, not a real great middle in real estate. Um, so you get involved in all these other things. If, if you're the manager or you're the entrepreneur or, or you work for you know, a big development company, these are, the, these are the kind of areas you can be in. People who are in multifamily housing are in multifamily housing. It's very rare that major uh, multifamily housing developers are also major home builders. Uh, home builders will try some multifamily, but most multifamily is done by uh, investment groups, uh, REITs, opportunity funds, 
these kind of outlets for financing is different than what a home builder does uh, most times. So if you are the real estate expert, you're the person with the MSRED letters after your name, hopefully you're going to wind up running these things, one of these things, one of these slides. Uh, you're you're going to have to be in one of them to be in the real estate industry. So go, well, tell me, why are you complicating my life like this this morning? I got a rough, uh, rough enough time trying to figure out what I do every day. Now you're telling me I got to make hard decisions with my life to do these things. Well, yes and no. You know, when the market crashed about six, seven years ago, eight years ago, and I was looking at the students here before that, they said, what am I going to do? You know, where am I going to go? This is I said, just go get a job. <laughs> get a job. Where life's going to take you is going to take you. But you've got to be out in front of it. You can't just sit back and wait like the bell's going to ring, somebody's going to hit the door and says, hey, I'm here to tell you about a great job offer I have for you. It really happens. So think about yourself in this whole process that you're going through. Where do I fit in all this? But I'll tell you one thing. Once you get MSRED after your name, no one could ever take that away from you. Those letters attached to your name are with you for the rest of your life. And proud of you. I mean, your, your business cards, your, your, your resume, whatever it is. You earned those letters. So when you're sitting here and saying, I don't think I can do this. I, I, I don't think I can go all the way with this. I mean, this is too hard. Well, yeah, you're right, it is hard. Uh, just a side note, I did all of my college at night. Uh, undergraduate, graduate. I never went to school, uh, 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 higher education uh, school uh, in the daytime. Not one place. So I can, I can appreciate what you're going through. I don't know how I did it. I think back and go, how in the world did I do that? Because I don't have the energy today to do it. I can think right now, but you have, you're young, you, you have the energy, that's why you're here. Don't quit. Don't quit. Because even when you get one class behind you, you're already ahead of the game. So don't let it wear you down. Because there's, there's, you'll get your rewards at the end of the process. Capital markets. Well, what are the capital markets? Well, in simple terms, it's where the money is. Okay. Now, whether you're a home builder, land developer, or multifamily developer, you're going to need money. Uh, and you're going to need a lot of it. And it comes from a lot of different sources. Now, well, what does that mean to you? Well. You can either be a customer of all these people, or you can be these people yourself. Banks need real estate people. Big banks, small banks have real estate departments. Somebody's got to run them. General Motors has over 5,000 people in its real estate departments. Those people are uh, real estate executives making a lot of money and so forth. So, just don't think in terms of, uh, I got to be a developer. I mean, there are opportunities for you uh, on the other side of the table. You could be working for a bank, you can be working for a regional local bank, you could be working with or for an investment banker. Then there's public and private equity funds, hedge funds, opportunity funds, family office, which is private wealth money insurance companies, pension funds, federal and state subsidy financing, tax incremental funds, <clears throat> community development districts, very popular in Florida, public partnerships, public companies, equity capital. Those are all places that control the money and the capital in our industry. You can work in either one, any one of them, if that's what your mindset is, that you want to be in a group like that, you want to be controlling and working with the capital itself. Uh, you want to be on the other side of the table of the developer, uh, the bank, and so forth. So if someone says to you after you graduate, you say, hey, there's a great job opening in Bank of America, for example, a real estate department here in Fort Lauderdale. It might be surprising, really good job. And they want you because 
and you went through this program. Because uh, they have to have real estate people. Uh, so you'll hear that from Mark Peterson in a little while. Mark uh, has been in banking his whole life. And previous, I mean, I, I don't know where he is now. But he was with Bank of America, and he did most of the financing on Los Olas. Um, so he, I can tell you, he's done very, very nicely in life, OK? Not being a developer, not being anything, but he's in the real estate industry. Can you explain what the community development districts, can you go a little bit further about how that's structured? Yeah. Um, a developer uh, gets a piece of land, identifies it, go, does his due diligence, does everything, gets, satisfies himself that, or she satisfies herself that she could develop this land and, and build housing, uh, usually it's housing, or it could be something else. It could be, it could be golf course, it could be utilities, it could be in infrastructure. And they go, I want to borrow money from the capital markets. I want people to invest in my project. And I want them to lend me money. And so what they do is they create what they call a community development district. And they carve it out, and it becomes, when it's approved by the governor, goes right up to the cabinet in Florida. Is that right, Joe? Okay. Goes up to the cabinet, and they approve it. This is a taxing district now. The people who are, who are going to live in this district uh, are going to, well, they're going to go out into the marketplace and they're going to sell bonds. People invest, who are investors say, I want to buy part of that uh, loan. I want, to, I want to provide this loan for money. Mm -hmm. So they, 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 they go out and they raise a million dollars and maybe a thousand people buy a thousand bonds each. They're 30 year bond, um, they're, they're tax exempt, federal tax some states don't, it's more complicated. But, so, the, build, the developer goes ahead, takes the million dollars he raised in the marketplace, and he buys, he pays for the roads and the utilities and the golf course and whatever he's allowed to use that money for. And he had two or three years before he has to make a first payment to pay the bonds off, the 30-year bonds. He has to hurry and build houses and every house then, a lien is put on that house to force the homeowner to pay off part of the bonds. And so they make a payment every year with their regular taxes. And eventually they pay off the bonds. And so when you're going moving, you're going to move into a community development district uh, uh, property, a uh, master plan community, let's say, uh, and they say there's bonds, well, you better find out how much those bonds are going to cost you every year. Because that's legitimate debt that, uh, that the mortgage company is going to look to and say, hey, you know, you've got, to pay, you've got to pay part of this $25,000 bond that's on your, on your house. Yeah, but I've got 30 years to pay that. I know, but we've got to show that as an expense for you, just like your taxes and so forth. So. The district is a government. This is really important. Most communities without bonds have HOAs. Everybody know what an HOA is? Okay. District bond, uh, bond districts do not have, it's not an HOA. There, there's no statute in Florida that says here's what, H, here's what districts can do and can't do. Like there is statutes for telling condominiums and, 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 and master plan communities and everything. Here's how you can live or can't live, and they put covenants in. The covenants in a bond district are controlled by the district. The district sets up a government. It has a commission. And eventually that's turned over to the homeowners, and they run this district themselves. They then decide to what color they can paint. you can paint your house and do all that. 
It's not an HOA. It's just a government district, okay? And all of that, all those covenants are approved when you go to the governor and you get your district tax district approved. Now, if the bonds fail, if you don't build the houses then, the, the bondholder looks to the building and says, look, I don't care if you didn't build a house or not, you owe me this money. So what happened in the last recession, hundreds of districts went bankrupt. Thousands of bondholders never got their money because the house was never built, uh, the, 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 the lien was on the land, and, the, and then the development went broke. So there, one of the great opportunities right after that was going around buying these bonds for 20 cents on the dollar. And people made a zillion dollars <laughs> from the pain of other people because life goes on. You know, somebody's hurt today is somebody's gain tomorrow. So, did I answer your question? Yes, you did. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Is that like a downtown development authority? Excuse me? Is it like a downtown development authority, kind of? No. Okay. No. That, that is a, uh, usually, <clears throat> putting it simply, that is usually uh, a group that creates uh, guidelines for development and then enforces them. Okay. In other words, Miami has a rule, I don't know if it's still in effect. Was it 20 stories? can't build a building, one section of Miami over 20 stories, and then it failed. It was found to be unconstitutional. But they try to do something like that. Okay. Uh, yeah? Um, talking about the, the bonds that would be issued. Talk a little uh, louder, please. Uh, so for the special tax district, the bonds that are issued, yeah. are those uh, general obligation bonds and kind of have to No, that's power? a great point. None of this debt and these bonds are the responsibility of the people in that town or that county. This is a, it's out on its own, it lives and dies on its own. So if you're living outside of the district in another part of the county or the city, you don't care about this because if the bonds fail, it doesn't affect your city. The city has no obligation to pay these bonds and collect taxes for this. What they do do to help the developer and so forth and, and, the, and the homeowner, they collect the bond uh, annual amortization uh, from the people and send it to Wall Street to pay off that year's bonds. The go most governments participate in that and help collect the money for it. It goes out with your tax bill. It's just another piece of paper that says pay this. Right. So, is that okay? Anything else? Okay. So look at all the different places you can take your MSRVD and go. All of these people need real estate people running them. You're either, you're either a, an attorney like, like, like Charles, who over his, his career did all of the legal real estate work. I mean, he probably set up how many districts? Me personally? Yeah. yeah. Zero. But you went in your firm. My firm did, though, yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. He was a boss, he didn't do anything. <laughs> No, he was the, he had it up, he laid the foundation and the platform for ultimately became one of the biggest law firms in the state of Florida. Uh, so, he, he, <laughs> I talked to him at the coming here today. Uh, I'm staying at, 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 at his apartment, my wife and I and everything, so I had, we had nothing to, they, they had nothing to do because I was going to be here today. So I said, I think you'll like, why don't you come with me? <laughs> so he said, well, what's it all about? I said, just come and see what it's like and everything. Well, I'm not prepared to do anything. I said, it's okay. I said, somewhere in the day, you, you're going to want, you're going to say something because you get, you get caught up in some of these subjects and you go, you know, he really should be telling him this or and everything. So I'm hoping if I say something wrong or I, I, he can embellish what I'm saying, I hope he jumps in. If he doesn't, he doesn't. Uh, it was a free ride to come here anyway, so. Okay, any the other questions on this slide? Yeah. So if you do have a particular interest in any one of these categories, um, say you're in our shoes, right? How do you go about positioning yourselves with these various entities? Knock on hundreds of doors. Mm -hmm. Don't give up. Make a, make a list of 
100 private and public equity firms. You can get them and just start saying, who's hiring? I mean, almost every one of their websites has a drop down that says uh, career opportunities. Said internet. Hmm? Say go on the internet. Go on the internet. <laughs> You'll be surprised. I mean, because we have a shortage in the United States right now for talented, trained people. There are 60, 70,000 jobs in management and real estate that the industry recognizes, upper management jobs, presidents of divisions and everything, we can't fill. Now, you might not be ready for that, but get on a glide path. I mean, it's out there. It's, listen, the guy who works hardest, the gal who works hardest, is the winner at the end. It's all about energy. I mean, you know, everybody wants a vacation, and I'm not saying give up your personal life. You never give up your personal life. You'll, you'll pay dearly in your business life. It'll, it'll haunt you in, in the long run. You've got to find time to get away and put it down for a while. No matter, no matter, no matter how much you think that organization can't go without you, believe me, if you're not there, you get hit by a bus and you're not there the next day, it'll survive. That's reality. Okay. Now, look at the list of this. These are all consultants. I mean, I spent the last half of my career as a consultant. These are all the different kinds of consulting you can do. I mean, I won't read them out if you just want to look at it for a few minutes. Um, but what do we got, 30? Look, there's even an attorney. Oh, no. <laughs> can you see this? Okay, come here. Yep. Okay. So you can see consultants are all over the ballpark. And, and why, why are consultants popular? They never were, but they, they became popular. Uh, the capital markets changed that. When the capital markets got more involved in real estate back in around the year 2000 or 1995, really when they started. Uh, the Goldman Sachs of the world, they were never in real estate, and they were real estate in a very small way. When, the, when there was a big depression, real estate depression in 1992 and 93, uh, and all the SNL banks failed, uh, they were, Goldman Sachs and all those kind of guys uh, ran around and started buying all these projects for 10, 20 cents on the dollar. And so it was a free for all for a while. But, um, so, like I said, mostly all these people have to prove to their clients that they know the real estate industry. They're part of the real estate industry. In other words, if you have market research, you can't go to a market research group that doesn't or, or doesn't live off of market research for the real estate industry. If you went for to a, law, a, real, uh, a market research company that did market research on, on, on breakfast cereals. I mean, they didn't know nothing about real, real estate. So these all require real estate expertise. And so pick your poison. Now, some of these overlap, uh, but in some, some way or another, um, all this specialization comes into play. Yeah. I need to decide whether or not to go with consultants or go in-house because it's obviously kind of expensive. Again? It's, it's expensive to use consultants. So how do you decide whether or not to go Well, here's in the good and that's a great question. Here's the good and the bad about consultants. You only pay them once and they leave. <laughs> if you hire somebody to do the job and you make them an employee, now you're stuck with them. No, I mean, that's really the way it's looked at. Now, uh, because of laws and because of other things, I've got to provide benefits. I've got to provide longevity. I've got to apply. I have to. I have to show sustainability. I have to do. I can't fire people in some places the way I want to fire them. I can't, who needs all that? Why don't I just hire somebody for what I need and what I don't? And then when he's finished, she's finished, gone. When I became a consultant, someone asked me. I went from running big development companies to one day I had a thousand employees, the next day it was just me. 
And so I didn't know anything about being a consultant. I hired them, a lot of them over the years. So somebody asked me that after a while, what's it like being a consultant? I said, you know, it's like being a grandparent. Uh, you, go, you show up in the morning, you play with the kid all day. At the end of the day, you give the kid back to the parents, I'll see you tomorrow. And it's the same thing when you get a consultant. You, you pick up this project, and you work with the developer all day, and then at the end of the day, I'm going for a martini, I'll see you tomorrow morning. And you have no stress. You don't lie awake at night because it's not your money, and everything, but you have an ethical and professional obligation to give your client the best you got. No one expects you to be perfect. Well, some do. Uh, you know, there's some small-minded people. If they fail, they blame the consultants. Uh, maybe sometimes the consultants should be blamed. I don't know. But there's enough, there's enough uh, litigation in the courts to fight over that. So <laughs> I, leave that, I leave that to them. OK, any questions on this? Did you, did you pick a poison for yourself? Mm -hmm. OK, so I hope this particular aspect of discussion was, was meaningful to you and uh, gave you some meaning. Let's talk about disruptors. Now, what is a disruptor? Well, it is what it is. It's something or someone that comes along and disrupts things, turns them upside down, uh, makes it impossible to do today what you did yesterday, and not going to go away. It is the new normal, as they say, and it just scares the bejeebies out of you. I don't want to make those kind of changes. Why can't we do it the old simple way? Why can't, we, why can't we do it the way my, my father did it? Why can't I, you know, you know, my friends who started work earlier than me, you know, how can we, you know, why can't we do things uh, that way? I don't want to learn all this stuff. Well, you know what? You know what? There's nothing you can do about it. So I, I've got a list here. Sorry, I don't have copies. I don't, and I don't. Uh, I don't think I have this. Thomas, can you open this up for me? Sure. Okay. I don't know if I put this on. Sorry, whether I put this on the. No. No, this one. No, no, it's not there. Okay. I'm going to read them out one at a time. I've got, and we can talk about some of these, okay? All right, thanks, Thomas. I, I, I don't need this. They still have a good sign for how I'm doing it. They still have their pencils and pens in their hands, so it must be making uh, contact. Okay, disruptors. Uh, extensive innovations. In other words, whether you like it or not, Steve Jobs, He's working in his garage right now, and he's going to invent something for people like him gonna, that's going to really disrupt your life. I mean, just think about your life without a cell, without a smartphone. And if you were to tell people 15 years ago, no, not I think it's about 10, you're going to have in your hand the ability to, and you'll look at them and go, good God, that would be earth shattering. Well, yeah, it was. There's more of those coming. Now, do you have to know what they are? No. You need to be prepared. You got to think. Advanced technologies that kind of overlap these things. Electric cars and trucks. I mean, well, what does that effect have on me? Well, how we use space, uh, space of, of buildings that you're going to build and so forth, have a lot to do with what these disruptors are. In other words, if General Motors has to tear down a factory and they go build a new one somewhere else because they can't build the electric car in the old factory, but they need a new one. Well, who's going to build a new one? You people. This is, this is an opportunity. It's terrible that maybe a whole bunch of people are going to get laid off, but life is going to cycle on. You can't be worrying about people you see in your rearview mirror. 
I mean, that's unfortunately life. Autonomous cars and trucks, the biggest, one of the biggest of them all. I mean, I saw, I was in a Google presentation a couple of years ago in uh, San Francisco, and they had some uh, graphic illustrations of what the effect on autonomous cars will be, and they had a, a graphic of three lanes of traffic you were looking down at the top of the cars, and they were only two feet apart, and they were like all the way around, and they were like three lanes of traffic. There was a red light, and then the light turned green, and all cars started moving at the same time. There was no delay of traffic waiting for the guy in front of you to go. Everybody started at the same time. So whether you were six cars back from the light or you were up front, you're all going at the same speed at the same time. You know, just think about the effect that would have on traffic and, and safety and a whole bunch of things. And so the road was only about two-thirds the width of a normal road. So uh, because you can put them so close together and they won't hit each other, uh, theoretically, I mean, uh, you know, there's a lot of fantasy here, but it's well going to happen. And so now when we're building roads, we don't have to build as many roads. And since people aren't going to own, how many people here own cars? Okay. I tell you, five years from now, half these hands won't be up. Because that Generation Z, they don't want to own a car. 25% of the people who live in downtown Miami do not have a driver's license. Yeah. And that's growing. And so autonomous cars, houses without garages, shopping centers without parking with garages. I mean, these are the things that are coming. Look at all the different uses of land because when these things go away, we're going to be able to go back into the urban areas where everybody said, this place is totally built out. I say, my God, we just freed up 10% of all the land in the city. <clears throat> what opportunities. Think. Massive demographic and generational shifts. This is a big deal. The 20th century was the, 20, was the century of Europeans in America. If you look at the immigration flow from 1900 to 2000, the lion's share of all of the immigrants that came here came from Europe, somewhere in Europe, over the centuries. They started from uh, southern, the southern Europe, uh, then they, you know, to blobs out of Ireland, Germany, Italy. Uh, but at the end of the day, if you looked at the demographic profile of uh, America, uh, it was predominantly, immigration was down predominantly from Europe. The 21st century, the we're in now, is a completely different ballgame. The number of immigrants coming from, uh, coming from Europe is reduced tremendously. It, now the bulk is coming from Asia and Central and South America. Uh, and that's the future, I believe, the 21st century. Those cultures will come, and they'll assimilate in two or three generations, and then what, 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 what do you think that the average American is going to look like in the year 2040? I mean, God, I mean, color, I hope, color's not going to mean a thing. Uh, you know, color your eyes, hair, this and all that. It's going to become less and less predictable and evident, and, and I, think, I think people, it will be a saner society, but I think it's inevitable. So what does this all mean? Well, I was, I was helping people build houses in the year 2000 in California, and the Asians, were, they still are flowing into California like they did. These are legal immigrants, what we're talking about. And they wanted bedrooms with five bedrooms, they wanted houses with five bedrooms, six bedrooms, four baths, and what they were doing, these were collections of families who all want to live together. I mean, I'm not, you think about it, can you live with your whole family? <laughs> so, but that's their culture. So
So the builders had to change a big part of their matrix of housing design to accommodate this new buyer. And that's still going on to a degree. Then we have the inability of young people to buy houses. Um, and we know all the reasons why. I mean, I won't embarrass you, ask you any questions, but I'm sure a fair amount of people in this room uh, took out uh, some part of this of this uh, cost of this program, some added to your student loan, or something like that, or borrowed money from somebody. And so, one of the factors you're up against when you go to try to buy your first house is the mortgage underwriter says, "Hey, you got all this debt to pay off first. You know, you can't qualify." And then the qualifications will become tougher. I mean, the FAA just announced the other day that they're going to tighten the screws again on underwriting. So where the average person bought a house, so-called first-time home buyer, was 28 or 30 years old, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, that number's crept up to 34, 35 years old. And so there's a huge demographic shift. For a lot of people like yourself, they went back to live with their parents. We call them boomerang kids. You know, you draw a boomerang and it comes back to you. And neither side wants it that way. So, you know, they, if, you have, if you live in a community or a place that has a basement, they convert the basement to another with a separate private door so you can come and go as an adult. But then the, most of the parents will say to you, this is my house and it's my loose. You know, so, so that demographic shift, uh, because of the sliding age group, is having a major effect. We have not returned to the home building industry of 2005. Now that's 13 years ago. We're not building anywhere near the number. We're not, and the prices are all different. And we haven't cap recaptured all the gains of those houses. And I personally don't think we will in our lifetime. We're gonna continue to find housing and shelter outside of what I call the second half of the 20th century um, uh, 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 model. And just to digress for a moment, at the beginning of World War II, uh, we weren't, we were, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, we're okay. Uh, in the beginning of World War II, 1940, 41, only 35 to 38 percent of Americans lived in a home that they owned. Only about 35 percent. We have always been a rental society, going back to George Washington. The war went on. We became an industrial giant building war materials. We built factories that can build a thousand tanks a day and 2,000 planes a day and everything. So we had all these trained people, all these mechanically oriented people, machinery, this and that. And the war ended. We said, what the hell are we going to do with all this? And so we started thinking completely different. We had to change society in 1945 and 1946. And the government came in and they created the GI Bill of Rights, which still exists a good part today. College education was free. Uh, mortgages required nothing down. Uh, so a guy named Bill Levitt came along. Mm -hmm. And he created what they call Levittown. And we, we had two Levittowns, one on Long Island and one in, <clears throat> in Pennsylvania. And he started the absolutely first major production, mass production of housing. He did for housing what Henry Ford did for the automobile. So builders now turn their attention to not building one house at a time, but to building a whole street at a time, and a whole community at a time. So the first master plan community of any significance in America was Levittown. And then they got better and better and better, more sophisticated, until you know by the 1980s we were building master plan communities with thousands of palm trees and golf courses and everything. They got bigger and better. 
and they became part of our lifestyle. And that became the American dream. The American dream became owning a house, mommy staying home with the kids, daddy getting a car, and driving to work, and that became the American dream. That what every no, no society, no group of our society before that had that kind of a structure. And so when we started doing that, and we started requiring the needs for uh, cars, automobiles, we turned all those war factories into factories to make cars and trucks. Then they came along, General Motors came along, and Ford came along, and Chrysler came along, and said to the government, we don't have any roads. So during the Eisenhower administration, they created the interstate road system in America. They planned out thousands and thousands of miles of interstate highway. An interesting thing is, when they went to Congress for the money, the, the Congress turned them down. And of course, it was like, oh, the stupid Congress, they, but they don't see the future, they don't see the vision here. So Eisenhower, who was president at that time, came up with the theory that, no, we only need these roads for military protection. What do you mean? Well, during the war, we found out that because we didn't have much roads, we had a difficult time moving war materials around the country. We, we, all we had were railroads, because we had no trucks. I mean, we had no roads. We need to build these roads for us, national security. It passed. And they went ahead, and for the next 20, 25 years, they built the internet, the internet interstate system, I-95, you know, all these different roads. Everything with an eye in front of them. And so all of a sudden, these interstate roads are spreading out all over the country. And home builders are going, oh my god, I can buy a piece of land next to that interstate. I can mass produce housings. And so we, we invented the suburb with those roads. And the whole thing exploded around 1990 when everybody said, you know what? We've created a mess for ourselves. We, we've taken all the homes and put them over here. We've taken all the factories and put them over here. All the office buildings are over here. We thought we were smart. Now everybody's complaining about the commute. Everybody's complaining about the smart. Everybody's complaining, so the model started failing. And we started shifting to um, what we call neo-traditional design, where we bring everything into attached we put, or we put commercial properties with residential properties, mixed use, houses on top of store, uh, uh, apartments on top of stores, everything, nothing new. We did this a thousand years ago. But, so we're in that cycle and it hit its peak in 2005, 2006, when we overbuilt everything, everything. There are millions of homes we didn't need, millions of square feet of retail we didn't need, and the whole thing busted. And so you are now living through the recreation of that, but it's not the old thing. You're not gonna build Levittowns anymore. You're not gonna build Westons anymore. Westons a great, top of this list, great project, but today would be considered way past its prime. 17,000 houses, you know, all spread out for miles, you know, with all of the stores up front, and you're not going to see that anymore. The Zionist is not going to get approved, and the Zionist don't want to do it. And you don't want to buy those houses. Okay. Anybody, any questions on that? Workforce displacements. I mean, what, what are we really fighting for when we're talking about sending jobs overseas? I mean, we can build things cheaper. I mean, we have a, a complex problem of the the artificial intelligence that's creating, or allowing us to get rid of people, uh, is creating a, a, what are we gonna do with all these people? So, and so how does that affect real estate? Well, we gotta retrain these people to do different jobs, they're gonna have different kind of factories, gonna have different kind of office buildings. I mean, look at WeWork. Anybody here work for WeWork or a company like that? You know what it is, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but. There are major investment houses right now buying hundreds of thousands, millions of square feet of office space to convert to we work kind of organizations. Student debt. 
major disruptor. Major disruptor. Just think that all student debt added up is more money owed by credit cards. Scary. $1.4 trillion of student debt. Standing in the way of a housing bust out, a uh, breakout. Why am I telling you this? Because I want you to think. I want you to say, I can't ignore these things that are out there. How do I make, get, how do I turn these into opportunities? What organizations or companies or funds or banks are going to be at the front of this? That's where I want to work. When you go for your job interview, ask them. What, what, what are you guys going to be doing tomorrow? Where would I fit in? If you can't answer, ask that question in your interview, you don't want to work there. You have just as much right in an interview as the hire does. I mean, I'm a firm believer in that. Because it's your life. Rapid growth of robotics. I mean, you all heard about the crazy ideas they want to do with robot. Well, my wife and I were watching the show a couple of weeks ago, and it was a group of young guys, as usual, in a garage out of nowhere, creating robots to do housework. To do all the housework. Dust, clean the bathroom, do everything, and totally pre-programmed to a house. They knew where all the walls were, and knew where everything was, and they just pressed the button and walked away. Now, is this far fetched? Yeah. But um, it, it, these kind of things are coming. It'd be easier to just do the housework instead yes, of programming a robot. It's just a way to get out and do the housework. Building the robot instead of doing the housework. Right. <laughs> so, so, what kind of use would a robot be in a real estate development? Either the building of it or managing it? If, if they're way, looking for ways to do housework with a robot, what about a shopping center? Do all the cleaning, all the scrubbing, do it? I mean, it's, it's got to be coming. You know, so maybe the design of that shopping center's got to be changed. Ooh, I better go get a, a developer to help me with this. To me, this is an exciting kind of work. Climate change and global warming. Uh, we could spend a week on that one. Uh, I'm going to let that one go because it's too controversial. I mean, I, we all have our opinions. And like all things in life, time will sort it, will sort it all out. 3D printing. Can we do that? Let me find it. Have you ever seen anything that shows how a house is going to be built with a 3D printer? Hmm? Like you should see the On LinkedIn. Why don't we just show a couple of minutes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you, do you, yeah. Absolutely. That's just fine.
This 3D printer is so fast because it pumps concrete at an incredible rate. 400 gallons or 1,500 liters worth every hour. That's one bathtub full of concrete every three minutes. The robot did it. Concrete's yeah. perfect for this because you need something that you can squeeze out as a liquid and then very quickly turns into a solid. So as the 3D printer puts down layer after layer after layer of concrete, it builds up a continuous solid wall. This 3D printer is designed in a way unlike any I've ever seen before. Its main body is in the center and it has a long arm that can travel in a full 360 degree arc and move in and out. It can print up to 1,420 square feet or 130 square meters. That's the size of a three bedroom house. The only thing the robot can't do are things like structural beams, windows, doors, and the roof. These things are still added by good old-fashioned manual labor. We're all fairly experienced with dealing with paper jams, but a concrete jam, I mean, that's your afternoon gone. Okay, that's the idea. And of course, this is the embryo stages of this. And God knows what these printers are gonna look like in five or 10 years. Um, so, but that's a disruptor because if we're gonna build buildings like this and build other things, I mean, um, General Electric put one of its remaining great products of jet engines. They are responsible for the maintenance of their the jet, the engines that they sell the airlines. So General Electric has maintenance facilities on, in all the big airports. So if there's a minor problem with an engine, they can fix it right, you know, between loading the plane and unloading the plane. They have 3D printers now in each of their remainers uh, facilities that can reproduce almost every part of the plane. So if they need a new part, they don't have to fly it in from Chicago or the manufacturing area. They, they can produce it themselves with their own 3D printers. Because it's not just concrete, it's plastic, it's steel, it's everything. Drones. I mean, if you believe all the stuff they're talking about drones, I mean, how, how materials are going to move. Uh, I mean, Amazon's going to deliver you something over the sky into your front door or your back door. It's going to avoid driving on roads or anything. And so everything's going to, I mean, I can visualize a sky full of drones. I mean, if you look like I-95 at 5 o'clock, but it's all up in the sky. I mean, I don't know. But, Nanotechnology, not, all I know is it's, I think that's, that's five, what's coming? The Internet five system that's coming. Uh, oh, the expansion of health and wellness needs. I mean, I think one of the biggest opportunities for developers in the future are any, any real estate that has to do with health and wellness. This is a, growing, growing need of society as we're living longer and longer. We have these gigantic bubble of, of baby boomers and all these different demographics coming up, people living longer. They need more health-related buildings. They need more facilities to live where they get uh, support, medical support, physical support. Uh, and those all have to be built. I mean, just look at all, you drive by them every day. These walk-in hospitals and instant care hospitals, they're all in brand new buildings. I mean, the, all those buildings were built in the last five or 10 years. And there's more and more that are being built. I'm always making money in the real estate industry. Yeah. Do you think we need to renovate maybe our um, nursing home system? Yeah, they again? Like nursing home system. Yeah. In a sense that the redevelopment of that, that would be. I don't know. Yeah. I know there's a shortage of people to work in all these facilities. Yeah. I mean, God bless these people. What they do is amazing. Yeah. I mean, that is not nice work in a lot of ways. And so, where are all those people going to come from in the future? I mean, South Florida. I mean, everybody knows. People from Jamaica and, and Haiti do a lot of that work. And they're all great people. I mean, I watched one, my mother-in-law, 
lived with dementia in my house for a year and a half, and these people came in every day, and I couldn't believe their dedication to my mother. And I said, where are we going to get people to do this in the future? I mean, okay, moving on. Amazon and all of those guys. Uber. I mean, where are all those cars going to go and park in... Uh, I got WeWork, Craigslist, eBay, cloud computing, and social media. I mean, social media. Look at the effect that's having on uh, on our lives. Facebook, incredible, controversial. May not be pure real estate, but it's out there affecting us. Okay, eight big housing changes thanks to driverless cars. Prime real estate will be unlocked for new home construction. I mentioned that. Outlying drive until you qualify housing markets will eventually reemerge. Uh, once the majority of core infill markets have been repurchased. So once we truly run out of available land in the urban section, we're going to go back to chasing housing way out in the suburbs somewhere and, and moving uh, the way we live in a whole new place. It's called suburban, is the word they use. It's, they create housing in the suburbs, but they build with it restaurants, retail stores, office, R&D buildings, and so forth. If you go west of uh, Palm Beach and out there, the GL projects and so forth, uh, there's some really great retail being built with these houses. Uh, top of the line restaurants, uh, clothing stores, and so forth. So part of urban is being built in the suburbs, and I see a continued increase in that. Urban employment should continue rising as prime real estate is repurchased for housing. That's what I mentioned about uh, autonomous cars. Will do. Density will increase. Well, density is going to be part of the solution. Uh, and you're already showing your acceptance of, of, of density because your generation, and I think generation now, for some, not some reason, you, you all think the way you think. 1,200 square foot is totally acceptable. You know, you're willing, people are willing to buy a housing structure, apartment, town up there with 1,200 square feet. That would not have been acceptable 10 years ago. So density, the government will get the word of finally coming around and realize that it, it's okay to have a small structure. Now whether you have a 300 square foot apartment, I'm not so sure about that. I'm still, I think the jury's out on that one. I've seen some ads in New York City, they got three, 400 square foot apartments. I mean, I saw one where the bed is on cables and they press a button and it goes up to the ceiling. <laughs> it comes down at night. I mean, so, but we will have no choice because that's all you're going to be able to afford. Those greedy builders. <laughs> Construction costs will decline. Well, we heard that for a long time. As, as transportation costs plummet for moving building products from manufacturing warehouses to new home construction. Now, that's tough to understand. I think what they're saying here is that moving all the building materials uh, from a factory or a warehouse there, uh, for some reason, the economy, the autonomous car is going to run cheaper and more efficient. And right now we have autonomous trucks in an experiment on, inside Miami International Airport. Uh, uh, a plane full of flowers flies in from South America, and it's on pallets, and they have robot uh, machines that pick up the pallet and they put it in a, in a truck and the truck is autonomous and it drives to a whole bunch of different warehouses on the perimeter of MIA and then the flowers are shipped all over the country. But on the airport grounds are autonomous trucks and work machines. Kind of scary, isn't it? Fewer home sales will occur as the elderly will be able to stay in existing homes longer after losing their driving rights. I mean, 
I don't I don't think the oh I see they they it's not going to bother them that they're losing their drag right I find that hard to believe I, I find that I don't think young people are going to be thrilled with not driving I mean we'll see okay so those are the those are the things I'm, on, I'm a, what I call the think category category uh, while you're going through this program uh, think about yourself. Uh, now, I know it's very difficult to change jobs, to go do something you've never done before. You say to some of you will say to yourself, I'm not talking, it will happen in your life one way or the other. You have a job and you get up in the morning and you go, I really don't want to go there. I really don't like doing what I'm doing, but I gotta work. I'm gonna do something. So when I when I try to help people, and they say, "What do you think I should do?" I said, "You gotta find a way to make a gutsy decision for yourself. Maybe you're gonna make your life a little uncomfortable, but you got If you're not happy on the track you're in, you're wasting a part of your life. You can't get that time back." They say you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. Uh, so I encourage you to think for yourself. I, as an old person, it's easy for me to say this. Because I didn't think, I don't know if I would have had the guts to just pick myself up and go, I'm just going to throw myself at something I want to do and see where it takes me. Uh, I think you'll feel at ease and happy the next day you do it. You're going to feel free. And I, I, I say all this, is, 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 maybe it's a lecture, maybe it's not a lecture. It's sharing with you a long life that I had, a good life, and looking back and saying, you know, these are the things that people like me could have done and should have done. Now, did I do okay in life? Yeah. Charles did go okay in life. But we, in our private moments with ourselves, would say, I shouldn't have stayed in that job so long. Or I should have took a risk and did that, or something like that. I can't tell you which are the right ones or which are the, the bad ones. I'm just saying is that give life a chance to take you where you want to go. Let me write this down. There were three questions, guys. The people that I mentioned know what I'm going to tell them. But this is the magic formula, if you want to call it that. The first question is, where do I want to be in five years? The second question is, why do I want to be there? The third question is, how am I going to get there? Simple questions, right? Oh, they're complicated. They get more difficult. One is hard, two is hard, three is a killer. Uh, but if you were working up a strategic plan for yourself, I would start with the framework of those three questions. Where do I want to be? Well, maybe you did your own due diligence, you did your own market research, and you say, boy, that's going to be an exciting area in society to be in. That's going to be an exciting new area of real estate. That's going to be, I want to, I'm going to try, I want to try to get there. Okay, well, why do you want to get there? Because my research says this, this, and this, but I'm going to need this, this, and this. And then it's like, how am I going to get there? That means not where you're going to do it. It's how you're going to do it. How much money are you going to need? Are you going to need investment money? Are you going to have to risk more of your money? Uh, are you going to need a certain type of loan? Uh, are you going to need a certain type of architect, a certain kind of engineer? You know, how am I going to get there? What else do I need to learn? So you can't get perfect answers to these questions. But you're looking forward. You're not looking behind. You're not looking in a rearview mirror. You're, 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 you're putting yourself in the future. You're visioning. Are you going to have all the answers? No, I don't know if has all the answers. But at least you're in a positive frame of mind. And hopefully you're excited about getting up in the morning and going to work and doing something. And 
I found over the years that you may find this hard to believe, but when people have an opportunity to really do work that they're proud of and they're respected and they're part of the solution you know, and they're not part of the problem, they don't even care how much money they make. They don't care how many hours they work. They want to be there at the, the winning line. They want to say, I was part of this team and I'm being recognized for that. I, I mean, places where you're unhappy, you see you don't get, you're not getting respect. Uh, you're being treated like a piece of meat in, in, a, in a nice way. But when your boss comes around and he says, he puts his hand on your shoulder, I know he's not allowed to touch you, but he says, you're doing a great job. Well, thank you so much for your contribution. Let me tell you. You go home that night and you say, I had a good day today. I had a good day today. Didn't put any more money in my pocket, but I had a good day today. So, I'm going to get back to real estate now, but I just wanted to inject some things that are part of all this. Like I said before, the personal side of your life is very I mean, If you have kids, love those kids. I mean, if you, if you, if you have a great partner or a great wife or a great whatever, stick to your commitment and, have, and enjoy them. They're not perfect, you're not perfect, but you don't want to, you don't want to become old and isolated with medical problems and all that, you need, you, need, you need to have companionship. You need companionship all the time. Uh, granted, not all of it is good. <coughs> I mean, we, we, we do make some dumb, dumb decisions about companionship. Uh, I say a life without it is really, is really hard. Okay. Mark Peterson. Thank you, Charlie. <laughs> Well, I'll wait for Harry to know. Catch, catch you. Yeah. Okay. Now I turn it over to you. What do you want to talk about? Yeah. How do you feel about micro housing going on throughout the West Coast? Because um, I know that you were saying that apartment sizes are getting to 300 square feet, but in Seattle, actually, the minimum is 90 square feet. Is what? 90 square feet. Um, for micro house. You sleep standing up? <laughs> Basically, I guess. Um, I've also read a lot about the fact that a lot of these developments that are going up are actually used in utilizing shared kitchens, as well as they're also trying to adapt um, a lot of retail spaces to be actually also on the micro scale. So then they are kind of like a put in, put out, kind of like a 3D printed sort of model. So how do you feel like that's going to affect the rest of the United States, especially since over on that coast, the prices are skyrocketing. Meanwhile, here in Florida, they're still high, but they're not as high or as ridiculously high as they are there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. It's going well, to get there. Um, first of all, a truism about real estate has been around a long time. The cliche I'm going to give you is real estate is a local industry, mm -hmm. that there is no such thing as a national model. Some things are close, some things overlap, but the, what, the housing that people want and, and seek in North Carolina is totally different than the housing people in Phoenix want. And if you try to bring the North Carolina house to Phoenix, you'll struggle. You'll really struggle. And we've all learned that lesson. Uh, Remember my guidelines, you've got to go and do market research and you've got to fill the need of the people that you're building for. Now, in terms of the, like Oregon and Washington and California, the wacko West Coast, like, <laughs> I mean, I did a lot of my work in California over the years and I have permanent scars. <laughs> I mean, because they're, they're absolutely insane in California, but that's another story. Um, the reason why that works there for now is you've got a, a sympathetic and agreeable government that wants this. They, they're caught up in their own philosophical outlooks of life. And they're thrilled when a builder comes in and says, you want me to build 90 square foot apartments? I'll do that. <laughs> because that builder's got the backing of that, that government. They want that to succeed. Now, if you come into 
if you if you came into Raleigh, North Carolina, which is a great city, I mean I call it a 21st century city, their planning department wouldn't be thrilled with a 90 foot park. I mean they will really push back uh, because that's the that's the thought process there. So it's a local to local issue. Small apartments are finding their way in our society. Uh, it might not it might not be sustainable. I think most people, this is my opinion, most people who buy 600 square foot, 800 square foot apartment do it because they don't believe they can do anything else. They go, this is it. I mean, I, they're, they're, nobody's going to sell me an 1800 square foot apartment. I can't afford it. And they're not going to build it for me. So, okay, I'll take the 600 square foot and I'll. I'll walk down the street and be happy in a bar every night or something, whatever the trade off is. Obviously, you never successfully do something like that in the suburbs because, uh, but I mean, these, these are the ways that society is trying to work its way out of the mess it's in. But where is the opportunity for you? I mean, it's not we're all in this together. No, you're in it together. I'm trying to make money from you for what you're going through. Is that cruel? Yeah, maybe. But if somebody's going to do it, and you don't have to do it in a bad way, it's, it's just opportunity. So look for like, things you want to do, but promise a chance at, an, at, at a successful opportunity. Just to echo that point, in South Florida, the waiting list is on three bedrooms. The vacancies and the ones in the tips. He you knows he's a banker. He doesn't give out any money that he doesn't see that he's going to get paid back. Yeah. So we all know the name Terry. Um, I know you know very well. I want to hear like what is your favorite story of working with Terry and why? Um, wow. Well, actually, that's a good one for us, isn't it? Uh, he's talking about Terry Styles. Uh, he works with Terry and Styles, and you were late. Yes, sir. To find the merits for that, <laughs> because you knew I was going to be late. Yeah. To his defense, yes. he sent me a text message and email, and he will run late. But you're still late. Oh, that's <laughs> it. Sorry. Um, Terry Styles. Wow. Um, I guess I. I it's, something's relevant to you guys. When Terry and I and, and, and a couple other people started building this program 10 years ago, there was a tremendous amount of pushback from the school. Fortunately, most of those people aren't in the university anymore. But Dover was not the same school that it is today. It's improved tremendously. And so when you get people like Terry Styles, and in some cases, Tony Treller and Mark Peterson and everything. When we set our minds off to something, and we dedicate ourselves to something, we don't mail it in. I mean, we'll go down with the ship, but you're not going to chase us away if we think that would be a bad thing to do. We had, we had accepted students in this program and made them promises. Uh, we, we had ourselves spent thousands of hours in our free time uh, to make this program better. We hired a great uh, leader in Fred, Dr. Fred Fogey, and he turned around and he hired Thomas, and we built this program up. But when, when, when we were getting shot down, Terry got so, he, well, he didn't get angry. He gets angry. He never got angry, angry. He just, he got serious, okay? And he said, we're gonna go see the president. So Mark, Harry, you're gonna see this as and me and Terry went and we, we had a meeting with the president of Oakland. And we just told him, we're not gonna accept no for an answer. We're gonna build this program and make it profitable. Well, this for its size is the most profitable P and L account in the whole university. This this program, and I think it was a Terry kind of guy looking at the president. 
universe and the AI ain't saying, we're not leaving until we get your commitment. So he was a great guy, he was a great human being. We had, he had his fault like everybody, but that's the kind of energy you need. You just, I'm not ready to say no. I'm not ready to go home. You know, unless somebody proves to me I'm wrong, and because developers tend to go ahead and do it anyway. You know, even though know, their number pushing says you shouldn't do this project, a lot of times we do it anyway, unfortunately. And we even trip the bankers sometimes that are leaving us. Uh, not that we're tricking them, we just get into our own land of do that and. No, they just give me a pro forma that has nothing to do with reality, and then they, well, oh, you're already close to loan. The budget's changed. <laughs> Any other questions? Come on, you've got to have things in your mind. What do you want to know? Because if I don't know, I won't tell you. What's your educational background in? Excuse me? What's your educational background in? I have a, a, a BBA in accounting, mm -hmm. and I was two courses short of a graduate degree in finance. I didn't finish because I moved to South Florida with a tremendous job opportunity. And at that time, this was 1969, there were no continuation graduate school opportunities. In other words, if you were coming from somewhere else, they wouldn't just let you into the program somewhere and finish. You had to start all over again. So I went to FIU and I went to the University of Miami and they said, no, we don't have any way for you to get into the, to bring that here and finish your two courses. So I said, okay. But other than that, that was, that, that was my friend. It's your turn. Um, I asked this my speakers in the series, uh, always have a theme behind it, but what was the most defining moment for your career? As in like the pro and cons of like, hey, biggest mistake or biggest success, most defining moment? Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say my defining moment to covered your wife. Uh, it was not just a moment, but it was a, a situation in my life. And I would say the thing that affected my life the most, and, and therefore becomes defining, was my relationship with the Urban Land Institute. Every single major opportunity that I landed into came as a result of my networking and friends in the ULI. Every single one. I mean, all the way from becoming a Pulte division president to uh, being a senior real estate uh, executive in a major bank holding company and then being president of one of the largest development companies in North America. All came from friends with phone calls out of nowhere. And you got to network. Mm -hmm. You can't go it alone. It's impossible. You, you, you're going to need somebody somewhere to move you to the next level, to move the needle. So when you get out of here, get in the ULI, get in the AUP, I mean, get in all these young people groups, take part in it, don't just show up. Actually, get on committees, get involved. You will be meeting people, they'll be friends of yours in business for the rest of your life. Don't lose contact with, you, with your fellow classmates here. Get involved in, in the alumni program for this program. They meet regularly. They, they be, like I always tell, I told them, I said, look, if you were in Harvard Business School and you got an MBA in Harvard, I can tell you, you will never be out of a job. You'll never be out of a job. They wouldn't, the other MBA alumni would never let that happen. This is going to be someday, I have my own dreams, that your alumni will be the same kind of uh, quality. So it's okay to be with help and getting help from other people as long as you're out in front of the help. You can't let people make decisions for you. You, you, help, you hope people help you guide you and see other sides of things, but you got to live with your own risks. Yeah. So I know this is somewhat kind of further away from the topic, but related <coughs> to what you just said. Um, how would you recommend someone to try to network out of Florida to the West Coast? Well, I, I, I'm, I'm a big believer for that. Uh, I, I think South Florida is a great place. 
it's, it's, you know, it has a dynamic economy, but it's not real estate oriented. It's a very limited orientation. It isn't complex, like if you were in a Washington, D.C. area, or you were in um, uh, Houston or, or L.A. and things like this, where you have multifaceted layers of everything. Um, here, it's, you know, it's condo towers. I mean, if you look at Miami-Dade County, I mean, you've got to drive 35 miles from downtown Miami to find a new housing project. Uh, and anything else being built is being built on three acres with seven units. Uh, this is, the, and so we don't have multi uh, layers of job employment here and everything. I used, to, I used to, I did a lot of work in California, did a lot of consulting there. And I, one of my clients was the biggest developer in California. And I was a lead consultant for nine years. And so people in the company, a big company, used to say, can you have a drink with me tonight? You know, so, you know, you know. so at the end of the day, I go, go have a drink somewhere. And a lot of times it was, where do you, what, what do you think I should do? You know what I do, you know everything. I said, well, I gotta ask you one question, because you have to ask every Californian this, are you ready to leave California? And they'll look at you and go, what? Leave California? It's like the rest of the world is like nothing but a bunch of <laughs> <laughs> And I said, look how miserable your life is here. You, 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 you're overtaxed, you, you, you live in traffic, mm -hmm. and, and it's, a, it's an upside world in politics. I said, you live in a small house that costs you a million dollars <laughs> and everything. Why do you want to stay here? Oh, but it's California. Mm -hmm. So. I use that as an antidote because I think the real opportunities for young people are elsewhere. Elsewhere. Uh, not that I'm saying don't try to stay in South Florida, but open your, your opportunities and say, let me go take a shot at it. What are they looking for here? You know? And surprisingly, you know, you say, wow, I can get, it. I'm in Houston, Texas, in marketing test to this. I'm in Houston, Texas. I got a four bedroom, three bath house on a quarter acre of land for $269,000. And my monthly payment's going to go from $3,000 a month down to $1,400 a month. You say, just for that alone, you know, you got to think hard about it. You guys ready? Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, do you think uh, real estate development in South Florida is going more north, like out of Broward County into like. You're staying in Florida and going north? Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. I'm, yeah, what I'm well, thinking. here again, you've got to do your research. you got to find. I just moved to the villages. I don't know if you're uh, okay. familiar with that. And it's, it's a development area that's the biggest of the country. There's 120,000 people live there now, and it's an hour north of Orlando. Okay. Yeah, but what was your question again about moving north and south Florida, right? Right. Well, it has to, because if you look at it, water's blowing up. Pardon? Water's water blowing, blowing up. That's urban. You're talking more suburban, right? Correct. Right. She's talking suburban. Broward were basically put that for the most part. Like I'm building, I'm going to show you something today. So we're building in Pembroke. Uh, you know, in, in, the, in the 90s and 2000s, we would do 2,000 unit communities in Pembroke at Fairmont. Right? And now we're doing, if I can find 125 units, it's a big deal. And, and there's very, there's like two new, two sites that are employing on uh, what the old school board site at uh, 172nd and then the post office at Dykes Road. So there's really no, there's not a lot of land. Weston is built up. There's a little bit in Parkland. So it's uh, moving into, you know, Western Palm Beach. Western Palm Beach is, is like Broward was in the 90s. So we know how much land is there. You can, in the 90s, when we're all doing our large master plan communities, and, and, and Southwest Broward is one of the best markets in the country. We literally, we had it because I ran Minto and the GL had it, Lenar had it. We all had the same graphs. 
and, and we were clocking how much land was left each year. And that's where we are. So now, like, we're selling townhomes. Is this the class that's going on the construction? Mm -hmm. Most of them, yeah. Did, did they go yet or no? Next Saturday. Oh, next Saturday. All right, so you'll see it next Saturday. So Chapel Grove is literally at, at 209th and 210th Avenue. It's on right now on over 27th, right? So it's a little bit wet. Yeah. Like, you can see the ember plates yeah. from the second floor. And we can't build things, so we're building single-family homes, but they're attached. So it's, we're building wide townhomes. You guys will see the models next week. They're going to see the models and the construction, right? What time are they going? 1 p.m. Oh. Does everybody know what an A-type is? Shh, <laughs> shh, you're, you're done. Go sit over there. <laughs> you're done. Your, your hour, your two hours are up. Go over there. Hey, it's hey you want to give that? Well, it's 10 o'clock. We're here. Yeah, I know. You didn't let me finish. Hey, hey, what? let him finish. Take What's a quick he break. Finish? He was I'll, finishing I'll, questions. I'm going to ask a question on the golf courses. That's basically it. What do I know about? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Charlie, he gets away with this. <laughs> so the master communities with the golf courses, there's not much of a demand for that. You're kind of scared. Anybody who pulls a golf course today is crazy. Yeah. I, I can't say anything in any other way. It's a dying <laughs> industry. You don't want to do it. Obviously, never it's like going. going to you, you can't make money. The future is nothing but dark projections going forward. We're closing 300 golf courses a year in the United States. Your generation doesn't want to play golf. The next generation is not going to play golf. Stay away from it. Life is too short. Let somebody else build it. <coughs> All right. So golf courses are a source of well, that little piece on, on US 1 that they took off for, for the big piece. Well, it's only 36 homes. What's the expense of homes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but that's a good example. That's an example for like Rain Tree down in Pembroke. Uh, they redeveloped the golf course. They just Melrose. opened in Winmont and Tamarack. You know, so you're seeing in Palm Beach, you got a bunch of them. So. And that's really the best use. Now, you got a lot of issues with neighbors and arsenic and all that stuff, but it's doable in a lot of cases. And I never said he's going to be the most talk. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> there we go. Let me set you up a laptop or PowerPoint or something. What do you want us to do? Are we asking, uh, answering questions or are we giving a presentation? Both. Whatever you want. What do they want to do? What's more helpful for you? Both. Both? All right. <laughs> you want to go first, Mark? Uh, yeah, mine's quick. Pardon? Uh, mine's quick. Let Mark go. What we usually like what we did the last day. Mark starts, and then it sort of evolves. We have until 12, right? Yep. So I have, oh, it's, it's better than what I did. Though. I got it all formalized now. So there's a presentation on the Central Falls, and then there's a typical cash flow model, so they can see that. And then there's a typical competitive model, so they can see all three components of the package. What? Do we need formal introductions? Do you know who are you actually looking at right now? No. No? Or okay, you didn't do your homework then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's do quick, quick formal introductions. I would like to welcome Mark Peterson and Harry Poulsen. Mark began his banking career in 1982 sorry, in Fort Worth, Texas, after graduating from the University of Texas at Austin. Let's jump a few years. In July 2014, he joined Fifth Third Bank in his current role. He's responsible for helping grow Fifth Third brand in the real estate sector by delivering the full range of financial services to the real estate developers. He is the current and past current past chair of the ULI, Southeast Florida Caribbean Industry Council, and is presently chair of the governance committee. He is on the advisory board for the NSU Real Estate Program. He's on the board of Jack and Shields Children's Center. He is past board member of the Museum of Discovery and Science, Make a Wish Foundation of Southern Florida and Community Financing Consortium. What he will say probably the most during his talk today is, you know why I know about this? Because I financed it. So he's going to be a very interesting resource for your education today. Harry Poulsen. Okay, they can be, you don't have to give me a big introduction. I'm a simple home builder. Let me All right. Start. Mark, go ahead. 
I want to know who you are. It's all online. It's all online. They can see it all online. Come on, Mark. Start. Good. A type. A type. So, um, so what I tell people, I got into banking in 1982. Yeah, I, I used to put a chart up, but it's tougher to find because it's a 30-year history of interest rates. And 30 years doesn't go back to when I started. Yeah. Um, but if you look at the, if you go to the Federal Reserve page and do look up their historical rate data, and you look from like 1982 to, to today, what you'll see is prime rate in 1981 was 21 and a half, and it came down. We, we were, when I got into real estate at the end of 1982, we literally were talking about if rates would just get to 16%. Um, think how much better this market would be. If rates would just get to 15%, think how much better this market would be. Uh, yesterday I was talking to a client, I'm looking at a seven year swap rate, we're actually going to potentially swap the deal for less than he's paying today. It's going to come in, all in rates going to be less than 4%. So, and it's a, it's a huge hotel, so it's, you know, for him, you know, 25 bits on the debt is important to him. It gives him that cushion as the hotel cycle goes up and down. Um, when I was Prepping for this, I saw some questions out there, and so I was Googling. It's a question for you guys. Um, and I, I'm going to ask a couple of questions, and I'll come back, and you'll see why. What do you think the maximum number of banks in this country peaked at? Like actual bank companies or like locations? Bank, just bank. Number of banks in the country, commercial banks in the country. 2,200. No, forty-five. Yeah. Hey, it's a number. You guys have no numbers. Two hundred. Three thousand sixteen thousand. No. Oh, wow. Wow. I want today. Today is less than what? Four thousand. So from from nineteen eighty-two to well, actually, if you take it from. Uh, yeah, from 1980 to 1994, that's 14 years. Did that include SNLs? That includes SNLs. So from 1980 to 1994, which you had those high rates, there were over 1,600 bank failures. The total losses on those banks was $320 billion. It was 10% of the banking assets in this country. From 2006 to 2016, there were 500 banks that were shut down. There have been no new banks created in the last, the, what they call the Nova Banks, which is where Perry and Tony go and say we want to start a bank. There have been no new De Nova Banks created in this country in the last three years. Those 500 banks that failed, uh, they only took like two and a half percent of the banking assets, but the losses were close to a trillion dollars. So that shows you how this banking, and the reason I'm asking you that is as you guys are getting started, where's the first place you're going to go to look for debt? Commercial banks. And you've got less competition, they're all held by bigger banks, they all got their rules, they're more picky <coughs> about who they bring in. Trying to get a debt alone from a commercial bank on real estate when you're first starting out is really tough. And so you end up having to you have to grow your from bank to bank as you grow your business. Yeah. So you start with a small bank, and then as you get bigger and bigger, you go to bigger <coughs> banks. And so so people like to think banking is a personal relationship, like it was in the old day, uh, like in my old day. Uh, first loan I made was a handshake with a guy. We signed a napkin. I went back and I funded the five hundred thousand dollars loan. First loan. Second loan I made, I ended up foreclosing on, managing it, and selling it. And I broke even when I sold it. So and I was still employed. So I guess my boss said it was okay. So today, if that happened, fifth third, I would they fire me in an instant. Um, it's just a whole different sort of. Uh, mindset that's out there. Um, but th those facts just kind of, when you look at the size of the market, um, the total debt, tell me, it's 
three trillion or something. <laughs> it's all debt. All debt? Yeah. For real estate. No, it's over 20 trillion. Yes. I knew there was a T in there somewhere. So there's about 300 billion a year that matures, 250 to 300 billion a year. Uh, life companies, year in, year out, I don't care what year it is, if you go back and look, they do 30 billion a year and that's all they do. And it's just, it fits in their actuarial program. The GSEs, Fannie, Freddie, Jimmy May, on multifamily, they're taking a much bigger proportion. Uh, we'll see how long Congress lets that go because there's some articles out there that Fannie and Freddie shouldn't be doing it that much on the multifamily. But they'll do a 40 year amortizing loan on multifamily. Nobody else will do a 40 year amortizing loan. Um, but, oh, I'm scared though. That there's, there's smaller banks that as far as are looking for new people. And then there's also something new in the market in the last cycle. The debt funds. The debt funds and, and the non-bank banks that are, are supplying capital to not just small yeah. startups, but to some of the larger developments you're seeing. And, and maybe talk a little bit about you know how the non-bank banks yeah. work. That's, that's right. yeah. so, so the non-banks are, are uh, commercial banks, Historically, we're the largest provider of real estate. That because of the regulatory environment. Um, the, when I used to work at Bank of America in, in 2005, we had 107 regulatory agencies we reported to. 2014, before I left, I saw a memo. We had over 1,100 regulatory agencies we had to report to. So, so the bigger banks, obviously the you know. What I call the top five: J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, Wells, uh, State Bank and Trust, and uh, Morgan Stanley. Those five have got more scrutiny for more regulatory groups than anybody else. So, the compliance department at those banks is actually the fastest growing department, and compliance is zero production. So as a shareholder, you really don't want them spending money on administrative costs, but they have to. Um, the smaller banks, the reason there's been no de novo banks is because the smaller banks also have to comply. I don't know if they have 1100, but those compliance costs make it really, really tough for that startup. So what Harry's talking about with this last cycle, we saw the creation of these debt funds. And it basically was, there was a lot of capital out there. People saw it in the RTC days, people saw the uh, amount of profit you could make by buying distressed debt and then either taking the asset back or, or cutting a deal with the borrower to get cash in. So you might pay, in real estate, you might pay 50, 60 cents on the dollar and you collect 70 or 80. And that was okay. That, that, that was your profit, that difference in what you were paying and what you were collecting. The debt funds wanted to try to take that opportunity because the RTC wasn't there. And what they found was it was a lot tougher to, uh, initially it started out trying to buy distressed assets, but it was tougher to buy those from the banks at the price they wanted. And so they shifted and said, well, if we can't buy the assets at the price we want to get the yields we want, what if we shift over and provide the debt that the banks aren't doing. And not only are we going to underwrite it that we can get a better yield on it, and we know what that yield is, we can turn around and pay that out to our investors. And so they have, they literally have become one of the most dominant players um, for what I'll call the bigger assets, and also some of them are really focused on startup. Um, Every fund's got a different, where is Walmart and Amazon? So Walmart, is a, uh, somebody asked a good story about Terry Styles. So Ken Lewis was the chair of Bank of America and I had a breakfast with Terry and Ken Lewis. And Ken was in town to <coughs> give a million dollar check to Museum of Discovery and Science and Terry was supposed to accept it. So Ken was 20 minutes late to this breakfast. And he is notorious for being the first person at the table so that he's greeting the client when he gets there. 
Terry and I were sitting there twiddling thumbs. We didn't know what to do. We were talking about fishing. We were talking about all sorts of stuff. And um, Terry was going through the pipeline and whatnot. Ken comes in. He's beat red in the face. He looks at me. He goes, pleasure to meet you. I've been working with Ken for 15 years, and so obviously his mind's somewhere else. Terry's looking at me and goes, you don't know your own chairman? <laughs> and we introduced him to Terry. Ken sat down and did not say a word for 10 minutes. He just sat there. And Terry and I were like trying to pull teeth out of this guy. And Terry finally asked what kind of car he drove. A guy he just bought a 500 SL, and so he got to talk. That finally broke the ice, and it was a good meeting. But I found out subsequent to that driving into the discovery science is Ken had just, and it was in the Wall Street Journal, had just kicked Walmart out of Bank of America. And he, the reason he kicked them out is because they did a, a huge uh, bond flow, and they did not give Bank of America a piece of that business. So he kicked them out of the bank. We were, their, we were their treasury bank. So all their cash management, all their sales, all their credit cards went through Bank of America. We kicked them out. Walmart woke up and said, screw this. We're not going to be beholden to any more commercial bank ever again. We're going to create our own bank. And they tried creating their bank. They couldn't get approval, so they bought one in Utah, I think. But I, it really hasn't gone anywhere. And the regulatory piece of it, the compliance, they kind of, the last I heard, they're jettisoning that. Because the compliance piece of it is so complicated, and you cannot have the, the Glass Steagall Act and a bunch of other stuff. You've got to be careful on how ownership of banks is out there. They, uh, it goes back to the Great Depression. They don't want industries mixing into ownership with banks. It has to be a, a, a light ownership. And I don't know all the details there. So, um, but you're talking about Walmart. Amazon is just trying to uh, make it you know, easier for you to do business online. And so Amazon's, the banks are slow to adapt new technology. So Amazon's trying to create their own, but they still have to go through the clearinghouse system. Um, you know, that's where you're hearing Bitcoin and stuff like that. I mean, that's way over my head these days. I've let other people worry about that. I've got enough issues to worry about. Um, but, but that's how Walmart got into it, was when Ken Lewis kicked me out. Um, and it was interesting because we couldn't figure out why Ken was such a able at that breakfast, but you know, next day in the paper we figured it out. So. Um, but anyway, the, so the debt funds, um, and they come in all shapes and forms. The debt funds, um, they're going to charge you a higher rate. They're going to be more strict on what they, um, on how they administer a loan. Um, Bank of Ozarks, who has been very, very active in condos and the high-rise buildings down here, uh, they're a very good conservative lender, but once you close the loan, they, it's, this is it. Don't come back to me. If, if your budget changes, you're putting more equity in. This is what we expect with every draw. Um, and, you know, it's just the people I've talked to that close the loan with them, they'll tell you. It's like, look, we got the loan we wanted. It's a non-recourse, low leverage deal. It's got a slightly higher rate. But they'll also tell you that construction draw process is a nightmare. Um, Can you talk about how many people are like every residential, commercial, office, retail? Commercial. So we, so we get an idea how to fix it. Commercial and post I do both. You did broker? Mm -hmm. Commercial. Commercial. So, uh, to me, the most important thing is banking, like two things. They're coming. One, when you start talking about with the relationships. Two, the structure and the leverage. In short, you know, how do you survive? You know, you can juice. I, I think if there's a message they leave from banking. So, so, and I, it's been so long. I've, it's in my head that I can't remember. So the banks will tell you there's five C's of credit. And the first one they usually will rat off is character. Yeah. And then they go through all the rest. And I, you know, I learned that 35 years ago. Now I just did it without thinking about it. 
every banker will tell you in real estate that the, the number one thing they have to get right, the number one thing is client selection. The number two thing is location. And that client selection process, whether you're first starting out or you've been doing this for a long time, uh, there are people that are really successful down here that I won't bank because they lied to me at some point. Yeah, I'm like, I, I'm not touching them. Um, and that, that, what Harry's talking about, that's the relationship you build with your banker. And you may follow him as he goes from bank to bank to bank. Because right now the average banker stays at a bank for like three, four years, and then they go somewhere else because they get there. Um, I'm an anomaly in that I've only been in two banks in my career, but at B of A I was in, until I got to Florida, I was in um, two, three, I probably had eight different bank names that I worked under um, without really moving my office. Because um, they, they got bought or they got mergers or, or whatnot. Um, the, the leverage, so when I started out, you made a loan based on 80% value and the client selection. You didn't look at cash flow, you didn't look at what the permanent market was doing, you just you got an appraisal, the appraiser said that it was, you know, it was a 200 unit project, it was worth $40 million, so you gave the guy a $32 million one. And the reality was is that his costs were maybe 28, so he was pocketing $4 million, but you were funding it on the back side. Banks didn't really care. SNLs were doing it. Banks were doing it. Everybody was doing it. So 1987, 88 was kind of when <coughs> first, in, in, I was in Texas. So Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, and New Mexico basically got red lined. And the capital in those states got sucked out of those states like you wouldn't believe. Um, the, and to Tony's point where he was talking about Houston earlier, um, we had a retail center in Houston right by the Intercontinental Airport. The loan was six and a half million. Really good guy. If he did end up paying the bank back, the price of came in at a million five. Um, that's how bad 87, 88 was in Texas. Uh, the rest of the country seemed to be doing okay. Um, but at that point, you shifted and started looking at cash flow. Because in reality, whether you're selling the home or you're doing it's the cash flow that ultimately repays the banks. And so you, you saw, you went from just an LTV to, it, it was an L, what I call a waterfall, LTV, LTC debt coverage. So loan to value, loan to cost, debt service coverage ratio. And it was a waterfall, your loan, your maximum loan was based on the lowest of those three. So if, if you, and your 80% became 75, your loan to cost became 80%, and your debt coverage for commercial was one, two. For a condominium project, the concept of pre-sales finally came in. Um, with, but no, nobody was really doing condos in the 80s I know some small deals here in Florida. Um, um, today, the average is 65% um, loan to cost, 65% loan to value, uh, one, two on, uh, one two on commercial but with a 25 year amortization. And on multifamily, it's a one two with a 30 year amortization. And then you're going to do what they call a stress rate. <coughs> and in South Florida, that stress rate is ranging between uh, six and a quarter and six and a half. Explain the stress rate a little bit. All the time. Yeah, so on the, on the stress rate, what the banker's trying to do is um, give you as the developer incentive to go to the permanent market and get a better deal. So we, we, we're looking ahead and saying, where do we think long-term rates are going to be in three, four, five, six years? And 
what kind of cushion do we need to be to be where we think those long-term rates are going to be? So as rates were coming down over the last, through the last cycle, that stress rate kind of stopped at six and a half. So even though you might think that you're five years out, the current market's going to be less than six and a half, the banks have kind of stayed in that six and a half range for the stress. But what they're trying to do is build a delta between the construction loan and where the permanent debt will be. Um, it was in the paper, so I can talk about it. Um, the Mellow Group out of Miami did uh, Square Station. The construction loan was $103 million, and that was using a six and a half stress rate, one two zero for a year. Once they leased up, they got a hundred and forty million dollar Fannie Mae loan on it. So, um, apologies, but I'm trying to see it in my like in my head. So then, the stress rate is you said the delta. So the difference between the rate of the construction loan and what the permanent well, finance is the loan amount. Uh, so when the bank is sizing the construction loan, so I'm talking about the delta on the loan. So it'd be the construction of the loan amount. Oh, the amount. To, to where you get to the permanent loan, you, you can pull some proceeds out. Okay. Yeah. okay. So. And that, and to Harry's point, that, it, it, I told you to agree too. You as real estate developers, the best thing you can do is get long-term fixed rate, low fixed rate on your real estate. It's the best thing you can do. It takes the interest rate risk out of the equation. If I can interject a little bit, which I agree with there, but the, the other message I try to impart, uh, whether it's you're in commercial or single family residential or high rise residential, it's, it's, it's tempting to <coughs> lever up and take on more debt in the good times because you reduce the returns. You know, when you play with those equity models, and your, your returns go up sort of like geometrically. Problem is when the market stops, it goes down much faster than it took you to build up and then you have no protection. So if, if, you, if you look historically at, at the great companies that have survived recessions and downturns, and there will always be downturns and we never know where they are. Even as we sit here today, some people are saying we're in a, we're, we're in a longer cycle than we've been in for, short, for, for a period of time. I don't know what the cycle is. I, I know we can, we can talk about it a little bit later, but the important thing is if you look at the companies that make it for a long period of time, like in my world, in the home building world, whether you're public like Lenar, probably has the best balance sheet, that they do have the best balance sheet in the industry. They're projected to bring their, their debt to equity down from, it's in the low 40s, which is extremely strong, to 23% of the cash flow. From the 40s, they're, they're no, I was projected, Lenar, no. to bring it to 23%, which is unbelievable. Well, the, if 40s is very, very strong. Uh, to the private companies, whether it's GL or Minto, they've been around so long that, like, when I was at Minto, I mean, we didn't borrow on land. Why? Because when the market stops, if you're not borrowing on the land, it's pretty tough to go broke because you don't own a bank anymore. You know, so you take out others and you borrow less on development and you basically building, you know, some spec homes and production we're going to uh, And that gets this, and that's why companies get through the, 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 the difficult times. Like even, uh, I'll show you when I get to my presentation, even on my small little deals now, I structure them the same way. Uh, like the one I'm going to show you, the land was, uh, let's say, six and a half. So my partners and I put in ten and a half or ten million. So we have the land, we put in 50% of the infrastructure, and we can build some models and specs all out of pocket and then get into the production you're basically using as a revolving construction. So if things stop, so we'll have some units under construction, uh, we'll probably lose some, so we'll keep a few deposits, so then you've got really two decisions to make. Do you, you build it out and just pull your money out of the land? And like, if you're a big company, which we've all done, Tony, you probably did it at Mark Brennan, sometimes you build just to pay the overheads. 
We don't like to admit that, we don't like to say that, but through downturns, and you've got people and a lot of this, no, no different than a large manufacturer, sometimes you just sell to pay the overheads to get through the bad times. But the, the key is you sell to pay the overhead. I've dealt with clients that were doing the construction drop to pay the yeah, That's not a good thing. That's, not, that's, that's, what, that's, your that's like a knife across your throat. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, yeah, yeah, that guy's like that. But, <laughs> that's standing on the hole and you keep shoveling. Uh, the, the, uh, so where was I? So, so anyways, or if you think the market's going to turn around, if you're a small company, say, okay, do we sh slow down for a year or two, go fishing and come back when the market's strong? And if you're a big company, you've got to keep going. So you've got to just pay the pay people and, and, and keep going. You know. And even in, in today's world, they were talking about the condo mess, or the condo, or what was really going to happen. I think everybody learned their lessons from the, uh, the, the last 2000, mid-2000s, the Baco. So what Mark was describing earlier, for all the guys that, that they're taking much uh, higher deposits, like you know, 40, 50 percent, depending upon where you are, over a period of time, which gives you a, a huge equity cushion. The banks are lending what, 35, uh, 60, 65 percent, right? After all the equity, yeah. yeah. So, so if if there's a problem, the equity cushion that the developer has between the deposits and his own equity can weather most storms and, 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 and get through. So that's where there's uh, the strong guys, even if there's a little softness in the market, will get through fine. The guys who, you've already seen one in, my, in, in Fort Lauderdale and, and there'll be others, the people that put that intermediate level of debt, which Mark understands much better than I do, in between the equity and the bank financing, there's what they call the MES debt, which has a high price and doesn't stop revolving well. If the, whether it's a rental or, or a condo, if that piece keeps on ticking. So if you have a market slowdown, the sponsor or the builder basically gets washed out by the mess. So they sometimes call it loan to home. <laughs> they get a thing of the nail, but they, 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 they get it at a, uh, a, a, a discount. So if there's one message I always try and get through to every class, whether it's residential or commercial, is. Uh, structure of what I call like a fortress or a bulletproof balance sheet that you can get through the, uh, the downturns. You'll, you'll compress your return in the good times, you'll be a little bit less, and you'll be substantially safer to uh, get through the bad times. And if you look at the public companies, like in my world, their return on equity is 14, 15%. So that, that's what it really is. Contrary to everybody who are anything and raving, the private equity guys, they don't want anything less than 20%. If Lennar and Toll and Hork are doing 14 or 15 percent, how's the Hamlet Larry going to do more than 14, 15 percent? Or how's anyone going to do that? They're the industry standard. They're great companies. And that's what, the, that's what real returns are. I'm sorry. Uh, we're invested in the moment these days. It depends on the best lender. But um, and the pay, the pay rates are going to be really Hey, hey, hey put really the phone good. down. Sorry. No, 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 no phones. Otherwise, you can go outside. I don't allow that when I'm My, my wife's yelling at me. Apologize. Don't talk to me. I'm divorced, so don't don't <laughs> I'll try not to say divorce. <laughs> <laughs> you know, pay rates are at uh, uh, pay rates are at eight or nine, but I'm still hearing accruals are at fourteen, fifteen, at some eighteen. Depends on the mess lender. Uh, um, you know, they're the mess lenders trying to get a uh, in between an equity return and a and a debt. So they, you know, an equity yields at that 18. The mess lender is trying to think he's an equity guy because he's putting the leverage there. You know, Harry brought up I, I, bankers love adages. You know, um, you know, a lot we all talk about. You know, it's the color of the lipstick on the pig. You know, it's just stuff like that. But the stuff that that Harry brought up, that is your best friend. It's also your worst enemy. And it's what Harry was describing is uh, exactly what happens when the market goes down or if rates go up. So what I what I used to do, but it, rates are so low now, and who knows what's happening with cap rates. But if you if you have an 80% loan loan to value and cap rates go up 200 basis points, you're, you guys can run the math any way you want. You're literally now at 100% loan to value. 
Bankers typically have in their loan agreements a loan value maintenance, which means every year, annually, the banker can come in and go, you got to maintain 80% of LTV. So you as a developer, as those cap rates are going up and that LTV is rising, all of a sudden now, instead of dealing with your business, you're now dealing with your banker trying to get him to waive the LTV to give you time to sell the property or do something. And in this environment, bankers don't have the leeway they used to have. Um, they try, but they do. The other, the other one on land, um, one of my clients, he was a land speculator, and I inherited a couple million dollars in loans with him. And, you know, it was Texas, and land just wasn't trading, so we were working on a repayment plan. And he kept telling me it was land. I go, and Larry White and Larry, you know me why. He was Peterson. Land's only good for paying taxes and mowing. It isn't good for anything else. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 um, I, I was curious on the mechanism around the MES that um, do they secure the right? Because they come in between so far. So the, the, the depends on the bank. Um, okay. I personally will tell you that I want the MES loan out of the real estate. And I want it up at the distribution level on the partnership. So we call it the partnership level. The, 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 there's a tripartite with the MES lender and the, the senior lender. And um, that tripartite agreement is with the developer, the MES lender, and the construction and basically sets the rules that you know, you're going to notify me if something happens on your loan, I'm going to notify you in certain situations on my loan. So, so you mentioned that. Uh, to wash out the, if, if it goes bad. Yeah, bad. so it's the MES lender is the loan yeah. though. But on the, uh, there's a provision in there that, that oh, no. my loan's got a change of control in it. It does not allow for a change of control of the borrower. So where, okay. you, where you get That's into a I'm sticking just... point with the MES lender on the tri-party is, think about that, he's got that right to step in and take over the borrower, and I'm like, oh, no you don't. You do that, my loan is due. Because I'm not lending you the money, I'm lending a bird money. So then that, that's a fight between the, the yeah. first of line and the that, that, that usually is the deal killer with the best lender with some commercial banks. There, there's other, trust me, there's plenty of commercial banks out there that are signing those agreements and they don't really understand the ramifications of what they're signing. Uh, thank you for the clarity. As students starting out, um, Instead of purchasing the land, right, we, we have limited income, right? Okay. Um, would you utilize a partnership agreement where you can actually get into an agreement with the landowner and then that person becomes your partner? 100%. And then, um, but then they still hold a purchase note on that? A, a lot of deals that you see today advertised are done that way. We're, uh, matter of fact, our big deal in, uh, in Pembroke years ago, Talgate, if you had, if you, somebody may know it's a pair of pines and uh, dikes in the 75. We joined venture with uh, a family, a crown family from Chicago. So a lot, a lot of, it's, it's not uncommon, commercial and or residential, for the landowner to, to contribute his land with an agreed upon value. And that's counted as the par part of the partnership equity. And then uh, other partners will contribute additional equity. And the land is paid out like it is uh, on, on any arrangement. Like if it was a home building deal, it's paid out on the closings. If it's commercial, it would be under refinancing or sale of the property where they would have X percent of the cash flow. But it, it's an excellent way for large companies or startups to get into the business and keep some uh, w w without putting out additional capital. I've recommended a lot of people if they're just starting, find an equity partner. So um, then that could be the land seller. Um, that's that goes back to Tony the networking. You know that that's that's what that's all about. Yeah. Very on um, the. Tri-party deal or even to 
control. If I'm a startup and the participating partner wants to run the project, leaves you 49%. I mean, isn't that always a problem trying to maintain control? Uh, to me, I'm more of a issue, but <laughs> if I don't have control, I'm not going to do the deal. The, the, the guy who's responsible. That's the point I wanted to hear. No, I, I don't. <laughs> But the, 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 the operating partner, there's a difference between 45% and operational control. Uh, the operating partner, and since he's the one who's usually going to sign the bank loan and, if necessary, guarantee the bank loan, should have operational control of the deal. As much as a lot of people won't want to talk about it, many of the deals the profit splits are not 50-50. And, and it, it, it even took me for a, a long time, because in midterm we only did one partnership, everything else was all in internal. Uh, but you can look at it from a variety of different ways. Uh, you have to take into account what the prep is or, or what the interest rate you're paying on the equity is. So like, 12% prep, which was not unusual in home building in 2012 or 14, and a 50-50 profit split after everybody's paid back, really nets the same as a 10% prep and a 45-55 split. But the profit split is different than control of the deal. And, and that's written into the partnership agreement, the operating agreement. You probably see, I'm guessing, in a lot of your deals, they're not 50-50. As much as none of us want to admit to that. A few of them are, but most of them are. Yeah. But it works out in the end. And the big rule is, you know, you make money with your partners, not on your partners. And you make, you know, that's, that's, that's the, really the, the rule of the rule. You can't make a good deal with a bad partner. So you can't do a handshake deal with them and make you know, a paper. But if you can't look the person in the eye and trust them, no, it's not worth doing business. Because any time I violate it, I get in trouble. So believe me. Yeah, I, I've got one client that just, he gets a fee. That's it. His fee. He does have equity in there, but he's working for his fee. His fee is not paid until there's a resolution, what he calls a resolution to the property, which means either permit that's put on it or there's something. So he doesn't get his fee. Now he gets some overhead payments and whatnot, but that's all built into the partnership. And it's interesting, he's got all his equity players put the equity in. He doesn't put a dime into the deal going into it, but he guarantees my loan. So we get into consideration. There's all sorts of legal stuff that I get lots of attorneys rich off of. So going through that. Well, what I really had, a, and I'm still far from an expert on the partnership, there, there is a limitless way to structure that partnership. It depends upon the circumstances, depends the time, the deal. And, and you just need good advisors, both financial and legal, to protect you. No Talking about control of the deal, yeah. can you think of examples where you're happy that you, your hurdles came along, where you're happy you had sole control of, of the deal? Just Me? Yeah. It's the only way I can do it. <laughs> if, I didn't have, if I didn't have control of the deal, I wouldn't do the deal. That's just my nature. You imagine putting up with me? <laughs> what types of things would, would fall into your purview? Pardon? What, what types of things, everything goes into your control, your decision making? Right. If you're oh, yeah. But, and, and, and I have a, uh, one of my partners who I've known for a very long period of time, is actually on the board at Nova, uh, he serves as like my gray hair my board. Because, you know, unlike when I was at Mishto and we had a lot of people that talk about a lot of different things and other specialties, I don't have that. Now. So I got to bother Mark or bother Tony or I have financial, all oh, different, these outside people. But uh, Charlie Palmer serves really as my board. So I can bounce ideas off of it. And we pretty much usually come to the same conclusion. We're looking at this, we're looking at it that way. But so, don't ever got cut up that you're always right, 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 right. I mean, 
you got to challenge yourself and, and challenge yourself with smart people that will look at things differently. But operationally, <coughs> I don't know the situation. I don't know everybody I know, well, the people I know, the uh, Styles I know always has control of their deals. Uh, the GL is doing partnerships, they have control of their deals. A few that hit the we always have control of the deal. I mean, you see a lot more than I do, but it's the operating guy. He's signing the loan, he's signing the name, and it's his operation. So really, if you're the investor, why wouldn't you want him to have control of the deal? If you don't trust the guy to have control of the deal, you really shouldn't be investing in that business, you know? And, and if you think of it as, as uh, whatever you used to put, but at, even the public companies, they're effectively, I mean, the shareholders are partners. Very. Yes, Tom. For the students here, yeah. well, they're not student, soon to be graduate uh, degrees. Yeah, well, most of them are always okay. working in the business. I don't know. They don't have a track record yet. Yeah, I guess but what? they have the fire and the belly yeah. to do their to do a deal, their own deal. They yeah. want to be on the yeah. The money guy, I don't know. He has no track record. So the, it seems that he doesn't have the leverage that someone like you has. No, you have a track record. You have a reputation. I wouldn't worry about you knowing how to build a house. So where do you have to yield? Technically, if I was really doing the building, you should worry. <laughs> <laughs> that got certain Richard and Gary around me. You, I'd no, worry no, a lot. No, but we're better than that. You know how to hire people better than you. And you know where they are. Yeah. So you got to make a breakthrough. you got to take a sniff. Don't you have to take a different risk? As a startup person, well, yeah, that's any business. That's not unique to home building. Any time there's a startup, you know, you're, you're you're going to take different risks, and you have to find a different type of investor and, and uh, who understands that startup risk. Listen, we've got some alumni, some of which I think one of them is coming here. Steve's coming this afternoon. Yep. Speak, right. Steve and, and Noah, I think, met at Nova. When they graduated, Steve worked for Altman. He left Nova, I think Nova is a broker. They formed their own company. They bought an eight unit rental uh, at Oakland Park. They renovated it, rehabbed the whole thing. And I went there yesterday to meet them because the, the, the last unit or two was moving in, so I wanted to see it. because They were Terry's mentees, now they're my mentees. Anyway, we still have a great relationship. And that was their first deal. Now, they were a little lucky in the sense they had an angel investor help them get off the ground. But however they did it, and, and I told the guys, boys, I, I'm really, really proud of you, because it's a good looking deal and they did a wonderful job. You know, so it doesn't hurt to also get a little experience with, with uh, one, one of the bigger companies so you don't pay such a dumb tax. We're all going to pay a dumb tax the first time you do something. Uh, yeah, yeah. Everybody pays a dumb tax. I mean, the founder of the Minto will tell you, the first house they built, the brick wall fell down. Okay. <laughs> so we've all done stupid things. The more you do, hopefully the smarter you get. But, but it doesn't hurt to, whether you're a commercial, whether it's a Styles or a Butters or a Colina or whatever type of company, or a residential one of the guys, and get a little seasoning and then go off on your own. You know, we're not, uh, we're not electronics where we're creating an iPhone, you know, it's, it's where you have a wasp back and have jobs and geniuses. <laughs> we're like an established business, so I think it's always a good idea, unless you've got an angel to help you or go study somebody to, to get a little experience, and then this education is supposed to also be also I mean, I, My inject a little anecdote this story, really. Oh, sure. When I was building, first started building house, really, when I was the president of Pope of the division. And we were building. In fact, we built one townhouse, finished building it, and when we walked up the stairs, we walked into a wall. But there was no platform. Anyway, the president of Pope came to visit me once, and we went out drinking and had a drink, and he says, Tony, we expect you to do five subdivisions this year, in your first year, after you get a road done. We expect you to probably not do well with one of them. One of them may even lose money, but the other four will be okay. He says, for God's sakes, don't fail the first one. 
He says, if you're going to fail one of the five, it's fine. Not fine, but it's going to happen. Don't make sure you do your first one the easiest one. I don't know how you do that, but that stuck with me a long time. Because we all have options at times. And you got to step back sometimes and say, you know, I can probably do a lot better here, make a little more money here, but this one, right now it's a little safer and I want to impress these people. I want to get the second loan out of them, so uh, this. I a friend of mine, he's <coughs> one of these plan shops, bought a plan to build a single family on. And uh, he, he, he was doing some of his, he'd been in other businesses and had some cash. And, so they had a lot of people construction bank. We did a tour of the house. It was over in Victoria Park. We're walking upstairs, and there was a water pipe going through the middle of the stairwell, and my head hit it. And I'm going, what is this doing here? He goes, you're a banker. You don't know anything about construction. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so what I did know is that's supposed to be a water pipe going through the middle of the stairwell. And he goes, you don't know what you're talking about. And we go up, and I was with a friend of mine, and he was just John, there's a pointer in there, too. A water pipe stops as we go through the middle of the stairwell. <laughs> and now he's turning red. We go up to the second floor, and there's a balcony with French doors that open up. Now open the doors up, and they go, like, thing. Uh, you know, <laughs> like, what the heck's this? Yeah. So I put a balcony. It's a three-inch balcony. He goes, well, they put flower pots there. The doors don't even open. <laughs> and, no, no, I just, I'm no, walking away no, going, He's a great friend of mine, and he's just getting started, and he got his plans for one of these plan shots. <laughs> oh my God, is he going to lose his tail on this thing? And he did. Um, you know, he's, he's doing great now. He just moved to San Antonio, and he's, he's having a great life doing his second or third career, whatever he's doing. But he's, you know, you learn from your failures. You don't just stop and go. Um, he's, he's doing really good. We all make mistakes. Oh. But that was funny. So. What what type of factors um, would go into deciding what type of a uh, preferred return you would want to give an investor? Like what what type of things would you? Uh, There's sort of like the market answer from this standpoint that different industries like apartments. There's sort of like a range of returns that are accepted in that business. Okay. Like apartments would be lower than home building. So let's say home building is, let's say, nominally 10. Apartments are we're on eight or nine, depending upon the sponsor today. So it, and commercial deals, uh, I mean, they're probably similar to apartments. Yeah. Depending on the sponsor, depending on the structure. Yeah, and uh, you can find it in some locations You'll see it in South Beach with some of the hotels, and those yields are through the roof just because of the risk of the hotel, because of the swings in the site of the, the tourism. This might be really basic, but whenever you know, um, whenever we're looking at say our first, you know, deal, what kind of attorney, you know, because there's a lot of kinds of attorneys. I don't oh, know to, if it's advisors really? for the JV structure for a real estate deal specifically. There's, uh, well, Charlie's, uh, that's his field, so he could probably answer about it. Damn good one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's, there's real estate transactional attorneys that typically special, that, that do a so lot of transactional. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I so think that you, that you need that. Right. Zoning and land use type of activities are very special area of practice. And it has a lot to do with lobbying and, and getting things done. And it's not that you are bribing or anything, but just if, if, the, if the people know you that's working, it goes a little smooth. Right, but more on the, like, uh, on the partnership side, contracts. the transactional, the, the, the strong transactional guys also do the partnerships. Okay. Like Andrew did our partnership, he did our transaction. Like Barry does the transactions now, and he does the, the partnerships. Thank you. Make sure he, he's the guy. You're, you're the, don't be his first partnership. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in, in, in your interview, you're interviewing somebody that you want to work with for a long time. So I think it goes as any deal. Deal. any deal. Any deal. Like Gary was talking about, <coughs> anything that has yeah. to have a relationship. I mean, if, if you don't like personally, don't like your lawyer no, for some reason, 
you wouldn't want to go there. That's saying the doctor and the developer or whatever it is. And as Mark said, if, he, if something happens there, it just doesn't sound right. The, 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 my best clients have got a phenomenal working relationship with their counsel. And they actually, if I call their counsel directly, it used to be you got to have everybody on board, but they're like, I oh, don't know, culture just talk to him. And, you know, so I'm talking directly to their counsel or you have to so my, my clients became friends. Social friends. Right. Yeah, no, I mean, well, I think my attorney's married. If, if I may, <laughs> if I may jam in. We're still friends. <laughs> so this afternoon, when Steve is coming, you will have the better timeline and better info. But Steve quit his job at Altman as a project manager, and they dedicated six or eight months for legal framework, how they want to form the partnership, how they want to be yeah, as a firm, what they kind of sub firms they, they have. So they dedicated a lot of time and salary into that growing process to make it really stick. And they just moved into their new office yesterday. Yep. They were working in Noah's, I think literally house or garage. And they just moved into the office and commercial over yesterday. So they're doing really, really proud of the guys. All right, so we'll, we'll switch over to an actual project that we did, which is the third generation. Of, I'll lead in with a story about Mark as a banker. That Terry and I did. Then this, uh, a lot of you may know, it, it's not too far from going about 15 minutes from here. It's at Sheridan Street and uh, and Flamingo, called Central Falls, and uh, we'll take you through that quickly. And what I prefer is that you continue just to raise your hand and interrupt us and ask questions as we go, whether it relates to, to Mark or Tony or, or you know anything. So it just makes it more interesting and more interactive as opposed to you know. The talking about it and like they will drift on for a while. Central Falls uh, project that we were introduced to in, uh, in Pines, which is one of the great cities to build in. It's uh, 89 homes, uh, two and three story tunnels. It's all sold out now. It was, in, it was from the mid threes to, to, to the high fours. What's uh, it's the, the third generation uh, that we, we did the, the tunnels. We kept on tinkering with the, the designs. The first one, do you have a question? Do you have a question? Oh. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, a while back, but I don't think anybody could see me. Uh, but um, construction known. Yeah. I had wanted um, Mark to just elaborate for me. Okay. Like, because they have, from what I've, I've read, and and heard that basically it goes by the day, like percentage-wise or something to that effect. I was wanted to for you to elaborate on the construction of the process. On how to get one and how it's No, 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 like um, how it works, like when you, you actually acquire one. Yeah, so so it, let's say you're, I'm just going to assemble the house and do one house, like okay. my friend. Right. So his, his because the cost of his house were like 450000 and he got a construction loan for 350000 Right. So he paid for the lot, called it 100000 and as the work is completed and submitted invoices, he's funding, the, the bank will approve that draw and fund money so he can pay the bills. Right. Um, and then it's just a matter of when he sells the home, the bank gets paid back, but it's usually on that loan to cost, it's on a, on a single family residential, it's what, 75%? 70? I, I do under so 65, 75. Yeah, somewhere, yeah, yeah, somewhere in there. So it's just a percentage of your total cost on a, on a first sale of house. Okay. Yeah, it's just, so if your total costs are 500 and it's a 75% loan, you're going to get, what's, what's that, 380. 385 is going to be your loan amount. So like that 385, like the, the interest rate, like. So the, so the interest rate on the every bank's going to price it through the profitability model. Okay. So um, this it's going to be off of LIBOR. Uh, this is you guys will so, so LIBOR is going away. Uh, it goes away in 2021. Mm -hmm. And they don't know what it's going to go to. Okay. 
So the 2021 LIBOR is gone. There's no more LIBOR index, and they don't know what the new index is. So there's going to be a mad scramble to figure out what the new index is. It's probably going to be what they call SOFR, and not the SOFR family out of Aventura, but it's called SOFR Secured Overnight Financing Rate. And the Fed is just now testing that market, and they're trying to see if that rate trades comparably to the way the London Interbank Offer Rate does. The reason they're get their, the reason all the banks decided to get rid of LIBOR, which is how most construction loans are priced, um, is LIBOR is 38 banks calling a phone number in the morning and telling them this is my LIBOR rate today. And it's supposed to be the risk-free cost of funds for that bank. You, if you Google it in Wall Street Journal, you'll hear about uh, Citibank, JP Morgan, Deutsche Bank, uh, Bank of Scotland, uh, uh, Scotia Bank. You'll hear about all these banks manipulated LIBOR. And they manipulated to get a higher LIBOR to get better returns to the bank when the market was crashing. And so that's the reason they're getting rid of it because even though it's been out there for 30 years, um, somebody woke up and said, well, these people could be lying and not actually given a true cost, risk-free cost of funds. So this SOFR rate, if, it's, if that truly is the new index that replaces the LIBOR, is managed by the, the, the various federal reserves for each of the countries. Is that like part of the, the whole um, blockchain change? Yeah, uh, separate. Okay, that's a separate. So yeah, this is a this is a, it, it is all part of the Dodd Frank deal, but it, it's it, is, it, it actually is part of Basel, but, which is the world banks coming together, and it's known as Basel Three. It sets the capital requirements for the banks. It's it, 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 it got rid of LIBOR. So it's going to create, there's going to be some disruption in the markets because there's a lot of loans that don't mature until 2030 that are based on my work. So. But just, um, just for example, like today or like so, so right now, like the percentage. Yeah, sure so I, I, earlier I was talking about this, this right. swap that we're looking at. So they're right. currently paying 5%. Okay. So their live work is at 250 and then they're paying the spread over that. So they're paying 5%. I can do it. I can do a seven-year hedge, and I can lock it in at three ninety yesterday. So, so that's the, the. There's a lot of options on the rates as you get more sophisticated. Mm -hmm. I, all you got to worry about is five percent, roughly, what you're going to be paying. Five, five and a half, somewhere. Oh, okay. It was, it was what three? What three? The, the when they all come together, what's it called? Uh, basil three. B A S E L. And the reason it's three, it's the third agreement that they've come up with. Thank you. Come on, Harry, let's get to the front. Yeah, let's get to the front stuff. Didn't we visit this? Thing? Yes, we did. So. Phase two. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you, uh, with Gary, you went to the construction? Yeah, yeah we did. We did uh, now, this is Central Falls. We did Central Falls in 2017 summer. And then I think you went to Chapel Grove. We did Chapel week. Grove last year. So we're going to Chapel the, Grove next week. With the shell up and right. Chapel Grove revisit again. Well, Chapel Grove this week, when you go next week, it's wide open. You'll see the models, which are for sale. Everybody wants to buy them. Uh, <laughs> and then people are living there. And then there's only a, two or three more buildings to start. So you, you, Gary can take you like through the whole gamut of uh, the development and the construction and the models and, 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 and everything else. So this is the third time, but I think to, to wind back to 2009, uh, I had just left Minto after 25 years. And I was, you know, opened up an office on the solar and I was 
like uh, I think Tony mentioned it or Mark or both of them, you know, the, the, I was networking, you know, trying to figure out what, what the next chapter was going to be. And in 2009, there wasn't much building. There was a fixture at Yolo's trying to figure this out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and, and Terry Stiles, who the school is named after, had a project in Boca called Blue Lake, which Mark was the lender on. Turned it down the first time, and he, but he, he got the loan because they bought another bank that had the loan, so he ended up with the loan anyways, which was good for us. And like even when, when they were rezoning the property, and, and one of Terry's guys called me in like 2006 or seven. We got it all rezoned. How do you want to buy it? I said, Why are you? I go back to commercial. Anyway, so the, they built seven units. Nobody could sell anything, so so they put a fence around it, closed it. Fortunately, they didn't sell anything. And they were trying to restructure the deal, their market for all the different alternatives they were looking at. And in, in, in 2009, the game with the banks was, how are you gonna like create a payment plan or write down the debt and get off your guarantees? And what I'm gonna say is we, Terry, Mark, and I used to do big presentations both at NOVA and, and at uh, ULI on this, so we had a whole presentation that just got too outdated and nobody wanted to hear about a recession, so I cut it down in a few minutes and I do a new product. But the, uh, so, so what happened was, fortunately, I said, I looked there, I said, there. It's a $26 million loan, and I was say, $13 and a half, $14 million guarantee. You're not gonna pay it back. In the 80s, we thought we were having a good time, and we were really in a big workout, so we'll figure something out. Fortunately, and, and, and I have I'm not saying this because Mark is sitting here. Mark was Terry's banker. Mark was was not typical of a, of, of a, a traditional United States commercial banker. He was more like a little prejudiced. Uh, 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 the bankers in Canada, or particularly uh, TD, where, where Minto was, I've always had his relationships. I know where my relationships are. Where they go through good and bad times fighting for the client as long as you're upfront, honest, and work with them. So Mark did it not just with Terry, but with other people, fought the B of A establishment for people that were willing to put in money and, and go through the long term. So Terry knew we owed the money, never argued about with the bank. So we came up with a plan, I did, I did the development, and the Mark and I literally had lunch in Yolo and outlined it in uh, an hour. Yeah, in an hour. Uh, we were going to build out 198 units, and the bank was going to get all its money. And, and, uh, and Terry and I agreed to basically create a partnership to do it. It took us almost a year to get it through the hierarchy of the bank. But meanwhile, we were planning and doing everything, so we didn't lose the time. We had to do all the governmental approvals. <coughs> And again, because of relationships, Terry had the support of the head of commercial banking at B of A. And fortunately, B of A still had a home building division. So the home building division said to the head of the distressed assets, well, what's your choice, Ralph? <laughs> we know Harry, we know we can do it. Terry's honest over here, they're gonna support it. We're up, so you're gonna go, yeah, I'm gonna get up on our deal. And, and we ended up doing the deal uh, and he didn't write down a penny of the debt. We paid it all back and tried to get it right done. And, uh, and then that product that we evolved there, and then, I, then we did it in West Palm, and we changed it, and we had some liberal units, and then in here. And then Charlie mentioned something about a zoning attorney a little while ago, and the proper zoning attorney. So this is eight acres. It's, listen, I love Pembroke. I've been building Pembroke since the early 90s. To me, it's one of the great cities. Anybody here live there? It's one of the great cities of Broward County. It's got a great government, uh, the, 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 the support development, the high quality. The, if you look at the areas, Pembroke west of 75, and then really from Flamingo East, because uh, we're east of 75, but uh, uh, Pembroke Falls West, because we were all done in the 90s. The way the city and the residents maintained it, very, very well. Uh, this was 8.9 acres. Like, I think when we talked, somebody asked me about a question what's left of Broward County. It was, it's the last piece of a, a 2,000 acre uh, PD called Pembroke Falls. 
and was on the commercial, and uh, somebody had it under contract for a rental. Well, surprise, surprise, the residents, where you have a lot of higher end homes in Pembroke Falls, didn't want rental. And you have a very sympathetic government in Pembroke Pines. And some people would say that they used the wrong zoning attorney. Are serious? <laughs> they didn't use, because the other, my zoning attorney, the guy that does 98% of the work, believes he could have gotten it through. But fortunately, they didn't use him. So they couldn't get it through. And uh, a partner in the deal called and said, you got to come across the street. Again, it's people that I've dealt with for years while I was a Minto and after Minto. Again, relationships, all right? Uh, he tells me the story. He says, you want to buy the contract? They want a quarter million dollars. <laughs> I said, hey, hey, because I can get so many of those. I said, we're done. It's good. <laughs> I can't buy you get a better piece of land. And we literally did it. Yeah, we paid for it. It was on a handshake. So that opened up an incredible opportunity for me. And the seller, for whatever reason, I got a little bit to go along with. He had another six acres across the street. So we ended up buying that, which I'll show you, called Central Falls West. So we had another 61 units. So we had 150 units in total, which allowed us to really amortize all the overheads over 150 versus 89 in a minute. So, and, and that's the deal I'm going to take you through. But I can't stress the, the, uh, about the relationships you start now, right, in, in the industry with your colleagues, with your alumni, and with, with, all, with all of us. They carry through your career and are going to open doors when you least expect them. Like, people ask me, most of the deals we bought, including Minto, when I was at Minto, have been through various relationships that occur and reoccur or appear or they introduce us. You're talking to them quietly. I gave you the same message. It, 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 it's, so like, look around and you may be doing something together 20 years from now. It's, but you gotta stay active. Like when we were in we were in a cocoon except for certain people like that. But once, when I left, you know, I had to like, I was a fixture at YOLO every day just to see everybody. <laughs> He and I go back 30 years. Yeah. No, longer. 78, 79. Mm -hmm. That was 150 pounds. <laughs> so you can see where the property is. Uh, yeah, so on the, you can see the composite. Oh, this is Yeah, so that would be phase one. For the 89 units, there is an office building existing. There's a daycare center to the south, and this was the 61 units that we bought uh, called Central Falls West. So, so it worked out really well. Uh, this was the pro forma of prices uh, in its day, and obviously it's two years ago, so we ended up averaging a little bit higher. Uh, interestingly enough. I do town homes a little differently than a lot of people. I really plan them similar to, to single family homes where all the footprints or the module for each unit is the same size. In this particular case, it was 25 by 50. Uh, when we go to chapter the road uh, next week, it's uh, 28 by 38 or something. But the reason I do that, I can change the, the mix of models based upon sales. But as smart as we all think we are, we're really not that smart. So the mix can change. But it's much easier to sell what people are buying than to try and discount what people aren't buying. And, and frankly, we're at work to our real equipment. When we went from Central Falls to Central Falls West, we got a big surprise. It was the first time we're used to developing land you know, Greenfield, the suburban, you know, whatever. You know, we did a high ride, you know, the water there, no time. When we got to this property, this was literally the last piece of this PUD, and this was developed, and this was developed. That was going to be an office building. 
we didn't realize the complexity of the infrastructure for us to repair the drainage. Monkey. Pardon? The, the monkey. No, no, the monkey were used to it. All the infrastructure was in connecting the drainage and the water and sewer and everything between the office and the daycare. So the demolition cost and the reinstallation it cost us as much to develop 61 units as it did 89 units. And our engineers never really told us it was going to be so complicated. Wasn't there a gas line crossing the property for the west? Yeah, there was a and gas nobody line knew that about nobody it? knew about. How did they not document that? You know, things happen. They lost the <laughs> You know, it was done in the 90s, and what probably happened, that, yeah, where everyone's running, there are very busy times, that one of the guys in the field said, okay, run it through, because there's a... <laughs> Some of you people, there's an ice skating rink right here. It's on the weekends, it's with the, the, the hockey and the kids and, and, and everything else. So, yeah, we found a gas line with no documentation. So, again, because of relationships, I needed to get to develop this property, I needed to get the guy in the daycare center to sign off. And I, uh, as it turned out, he didn't have a deed to this land, he just had a license. For so I said, I do this and this and this, I'll give you the deed at the end. And this guy in the arena, he had an easement that was useless to him. And it was a little difficult to track down until we, we found out we had a mutual friend who was, this guy, he, he, created, he builds the high-rise windows. It turned out one of my friends is one, one of his biggest customers, so we got that resolved. And it was lucky for him he got it resolved. Well, I mean, both of us says, when I called him to tell him about the gas light, he said, hey, I gas light, I'm out of business. I said, well, don't worry. <laughs> you work with me, I'll work with you. One of the big lies in the industry <laughs> about business is as-built drawings. Oh. As-built drawings. You know, every project's supposed to turn into the government at the end, the way, a set of drawings, the way things are built. That gas line was supposed to be we're also supposed to have an easement. <laughs> so, when you're doing due diligence, measure twice, cut once. <laughs> Which one sold the most? That's what I was just going to tell you. The, uh, what helped us, uh, well, the Flamingo and the Mango uh, sold the most because they were the lowest price. We budgeted a third of the sales to be the three-story. I'll show the units uh, a little bit after this. So you mentioned it was it's advantageous to have the multiple unit types as you're building it out because whatever you're selling, that's what you build more of? Yeah. Well, see, because all these modules are the same size. Okay. Okay. So they're all they're interchangeable, building by building. So from a market segmentation standpoint, and then we had to introduce another model. So the flamingo, which I'll show you, is the three, two and a half. And so is the mango. They're two story. There's a big, you know, three mid three fifties, high three fifties. Uh, it hits one market. Then we introduce these other two units. Because remember, there's no real, I'll call it empty nester professional couple product in that marketplace because there's no single family land. So there's no place for these people that are want the low maintenance lifestyle or, or a different type of home to go to. So we were able to, to, to sell these larger units basically, and there's also a big multi-generational market. Very good. So they have, like, so then they have an identical footprint. So yeah. So what happened here? We had one third of the sales were the two larger units, <laughs> and on the west, it grew to fifty percent. And because they have higher prices, because the people in that price range buy a lot more options, which we got a higher margin, that offset the increased infrastructure. So sometimes you're smart and sometimes you're lucky. Mm -hmm.
Thank you. Much better to be lucky. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, basically, and it happened with a lot of the sites, particularly now in, in, in uh, Broward and in Dade, you'll need a land use plan change also because we're taking commercial land or what somebody mentioned earlier, golf course land to residential land. So it, it can't be done just locally. Uh, it also has to go through the state. So the whole process because of certain legislative schedules you can't, if you have to go through the land use plan, you're not going to do it in less than 13 months. I've done it now three times with the city of Pembroke. And when, even when they did their own land use plan changes at city center, it took them 13 months. So it's, it's a process that's what I do. And then different cities have different site plan approval processes. It's a goal from, uh, I just did one in uh, three months or so. I think it's 60, 90 days. And, Beach and Westlake to be nine months in some city. So as you're going through your planning and zoning, yeah. and you have your cost somewhat already worked in, yeah. how are you budgeting for the rising cost of labor and materials? Uh, it's a good 